All right. Welcome, everybody, to Standing for Truth. My name is Donnie, and I am your host and moderator for tonight's much anticipated open mic debate challenge on creation versus evolution. And I am thrilled, as always, to have two well informed and highly knowledgeable creationists with me for tonight's event John Mackay, the creation guy and Joseph Hubbard, two of my favorite creationists. And so I am pumped for this. Gentlemen, how are you both doing tonight? All right, down here in Australia, and I even bought some fossils with me, like this stuff here from the Kingdom of the Gons in India, which uh, gave rise to the modern concept of Gondwana land. So all sorts of interesting stuff uh, tonight. And I'm doing uh, all right, a little bit weary. <laughs> we hit the road uh, uh, on the 30th of January in the United States, and I sort of haven't stopped since. And we've driven from Tennessee all the way down to Louisiana, all the way across to Tucson, Arizona, all the way back via Dallas and uh, onwards and upwards. So uh, we've been we've been flying around the place, but we're doing good. We're doing good. Good. You've got great stamina and impressive endurance, uh, Joe. I am uh, pumped for this. So briefly, before I hand it uh, to you, Joe, I will go over tonight's format and structure as I see uh, people making their way in, into the audience, a good healthy mix of critics and non-critics. And so we're going to start off with a brief presentation from Joe Hubbard, and then we are going to invite our first two skeptics or interlocutors here uh, for some impromptu debate. And then after our first two guests, we're going to hand it over to John Mackay, who's going to give his own presentation. And then immediately following his presentation, we'll open it up for all other guests. And so, okay, I think we'll just get right into it and, and have some fun. So Indiana, Joe Hubbard, I'm going to hand it over to you, my brother, to kick off uh, this event. Go ahead. Thank you. Well, just a, uh, a brief little introduction from me and a little bit of a, a background as to uh, what I've been doing over the last few days. But just two days ago, we collected some of these fossils. And you might just be able to see some of the detail there. This is a giant fossil uh, equisetum, the uh, the horsetail rush. And it's a, it's a pretty large one. There's slightly smaller one there and uh, in today's world these equisetums are still around they're little spindly little uh, rushes we call the mare's tail in the uk or uh, horse tail rushes i think you call them over here but there's some really nice fossils and we were quite pleased to have found this location it's one that um hasn't been visited for for quite a while and so we have got quite lost i have to admit uh, on the way trying to get there but we had the uh, sort of basic directions and we made our way there and the reason why we were going there is because there are some of the best preserved polystrate trees to be found um pretty much anywhere in the uh well certainly in the united states almost uh in the world as well if we just show up my slides there you'll see a picture uh next to where we found them by the way when we found these trees they were sort of completely uh overgrown and buried uh beneath a, a brand new logging trail that had been put in high up above these cliffs here and um we had to sort of clear away all of the logs and the branches that had kind of come down and covered them over so we're returning on saturday we're trying clear it up a little bit more and taking the cameras and trying to film some stuff and uh, try and clean up a few of these trees because they've got a bit uh, eroded away since they were first discovered a few years back but there's some really nice examples of this concept of what we call polystrate trees which was a term coined by professor Derek Ager uh, in his book the new catastrophism and uh, his point is a point that we wholeheartedly agree with it's very difficult to try and explain these trees having slowly uh, gradually accumulated sediment around them over vast periods of time until you eventually get a fossil these trees are also sitting on top of a coal uh, mine as well in fact that whole valley which you can sort of just about see out to the left hand side is actually a coal mine itself we're not talking a mine in the conventional sense of sort of digging down underground uh, the coal seam this is high up in the mountains right very high elevation and so the coal 
mine is literally just take off the top layer and scoop the coal out basically um and then let it sort of be back filled in so uh you walk down along the bottom of this mine the bottom of this valley mine and over on your side you see these beautiful trees there's about six of them in this one area um nobody's ventured down much further to see what else is there so we're going to go and try and uh, try that out and see how far down these trees go but uh, the other interesting thing is there was a new logging trail put up um along the 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 next layer above if you like and so we found well that's where we found all these loose ones just kind of lying around uh, and having spoken to john who's probably got the most experience uh, of anybody in the world in poly straight trees uh, what we've sort of come to realize is that because this is a new logging trail a lot of these have probably been scraped from another layer of trees that are above this layer and they've been scraped out and pushed down so if we can trace this trail back uh, Lord willing, we'll be able to find some more of these trees there. So we're headed back with a team to go and try and uh, do some more research here, as well as see what other fossils we can find. But these uh, fabulous polystrate trees, oh, polystrate, by the way, like I say, a term coined by Professor Derek Ager, poly meaning many, straight referring to strata or layers. These are trees which cut up through many layers of rock. And if you read your rocks as a history of time, and these rocks supposedly that are forming in a swamp where you have the coal and very gradual accumulation of rocks that build up over vast periods of time, in fact, you can easily do the calculation by taking the thickness of the deposit and dividing it by the time that it supposedly took to accumulate, and you end up as Professor Derek Ager pointed out, with ludicrous results. Um, you really do. So you are forced to then go into a large-scale flooded type deposit, particularly when you look at the way that trees behave when they become waterlogged. And you can see this from the tiniest matchstick up to the largest redwood tree. They all behave the same way when they get waterlogged and they bend up upright into the water, sit upright in the water, waiting to be buried. Um, of course, if they never do get buried with enough sediment, they simply rot away. So you really do have to have the right conditions present in order to produce such a fossil tree, uh, particularly a polystrate tree like this one. Um, and as Professor Derek Ager also pointed out, the Carboniferous deposits, oh, you call them Pennsylvania and Mississippian over in the States, but it's the same kind of rock deposit. It's the same sequence. These Carboniferous deposits, Upper and Lower Pennsylvania and Mississippian, go all around the world. Um, so you can trace them from as far over as uh, the United States and Canada across to England through Europe down through Asia and they turn up uh, down on the west coast of Australia as well so really amazing trees you can see Dr Glenn Wilson there who I took out for the first time to go and find these trees we've just cleared around a load of the rubble and stuff so pray for us as we head back there in a couple of days time with a team um, to try and uh, see if we can find some more and get some good film and some good footage because it really is vital research that's going on here in the US at the moment. Um, by the way, just a little bit of a brief update about some of the activities of creation research. Uh, we've had a load of new things happen in the last, well, couple of months, really. Um, number one, you can now follow me and the ministry and the work and the research that we're doing, as well as the travels, which churches will be in, where we'll be speaking, uh, as well as Bible studies and all sorts of stuff like that. You can find a Telegram channel, which you can follow. It's it's free to download, free to join, free to follow. Joe Hubbard Creation Research is where you want to look for if you're interested in following the ministry and the work which we're doing. Uh, most recently, I spoke at this place, which is now going to be the largest uh, creation museum, or I should say science museum based on the Bible in the world, which is the David Reeves Ministries Wonder Center and Science Museum. He's got a fabulous new facility there, and we had a live stream broadcast on the pagan roots of evolution, which is a fascinating dig back through history uh, and looking at the history of geology. So you can uh, get this very shortly. It was live streamed uh, out on his program channel, but uh, you can get this very soon as a digital download and as a DVD, uh, and there's programs similar to this uh, online that we've done. So do check that out and check out his center as well. He's got a lot of our fossils in there that we've donated to him, and we're working very closely uh, with media production and the like. So uh, do check out the David Reeves Ministry channel. And brand new from Creation Research, this went live uh, just today, I believe, but Sam's in the chat. He'll let us know because he's really brainstormed this uh, this pro project. 
Creation Research Live. Uh, you'll know that a few months ago we started a new live broadcast 24-7 around the clock of all content creation research. Well, we'll be honest, DVDs and the like are on their way out now, so we have produced our own website and very shortly an app, which is a streaming site, a streaming platform for everything creation research. It includes all of our free content. It will include all eventually, uh, and by eventually I mean in the next month or so, um, um, all of our live streams, including the weekly broadcast creation conversations and everything else as well. Uh, it's now available. You can go and check it out, creationresearch.live, because it also has all of our debates on there, all of our premium documentaries, all of the lectures and discussions and debates and everything that we've done over the last, well, really 30 to 40 years at Creation Research, and we're continuing to produce. And it's all there on our website. So you can get both the free content, you can support and with a sh uh, low monthly subscription, you can actually get access to all creation research content. We're including all of the premium documentaries and everything else. So go check out creationresearch.live. And John, um, if you're there, I also noticed that, uh, I don't know whether it went out today or yesterday, but creationresearch.net has got an upgrade as well. Correct. Yes, it certainly has an upgrade. The whole website, we've still got to put things like the shop up, but the basic content and the evidence that God did create, regardless of what our sceptical friends tonight might say or challenge, is certainly on that new new website. So there you go. All that. That's me finished there, John. So um, back to you, Johnny, and let's uh, kick things off. Let's have some fun. Okay, Joe, I appreciate that uh, introduction. Uh, gentlemen, you're both doing excellent work over at Creation Research. So I do want to encourage the audience, do check the description box of tonight's open mic event where I do have all the, the relevant links for people to, to check out. Okay, so we are going to bring in our first couple guests. How we typically do these more formal open mic debate challenges is I will have somebody on deck and then also somebody who is directly uh, engaging. And so I will bring in the first two critics. We got Mr. Anderson and Jackson Rowe. Jackson, you're going to be on deck over here. And Mr. Anderson will be the first to engage Joe and John. So Mr. Anderson, you're definitely no stranger to open mic debates and debates in general. So it is great to have you for this. Uh, firstly, how you doing tonight? And what's the first topic you'd like to discuss? Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm doing good, uh, Donnie, and thanks for having me on. And uh, uh, John and Joe, it's nice to meet you guys. And um, <clears throat> I guess uh, by way of introduction, uh, my name is Mr. Anderson, and I am mean to people on the internet. Um, I'm always very polite about it, though. I just tend to sometimes ask sort of tough questions. And by the way, to the viewers, if that's something you enjoy watching or you want to learn how to do it yourself, then well, you might like my content. So keep an eye out. I'm on this channel a lot. And at some point, I might even throw it up on a channel. Nothing yet, though. But <clears throat> what I wanted to talk to you fine gentlemen about is microfossils. Now, I've heard many people talk many times about the ordering of the fossil record. And I believe you both said uh, on a number of occasions that it can be explained by a combination of several factors. And I just want to make sure that uh, I've got that correct. So my understanding is that um, those factors are, in general, uh, environment, mobility, and intelligence. And we'll go through what those are uh, in a moment. Um, but is that generally accurate? Maybe I'll just ask Joe. Is that generally accurate in terms yeah, I of... Think we, I think we may have lost John there. Has John dropped off completely, Donnie? Yes, I don't see him backstage. I think he might have accidentally oh, left the studio. Yeah, but we can definitely... He's, he's calling me one second. So. Okay. <laughs> no worries. And... We might be. Uh, we occasionally have um, issues with John and technology, so bear with me. No I worries, had an Mr. Episode. Anderson. Okay. Hold, uh, hold on to that question. I'll uh, put Joe on mute and let the audience know as we're, we're getting more and more people. What we're doing is we just finished a uh, brief opening statement. Actually, I see John. He's back. Okay. We just finished a brief opening statement from Joe. We're now going to interact with our first two guests, Mr. Anderson, Jackson Rowe, and then uh, John, he'll be giving a brief presentation. And then that's when we're going to bring everybody else in. So this is going to be a comprehensive night of discussion. John, Good to have you back, brother. You left us. Good. I don't know what happened there, but I disappeared. That's the internet for you. 
the way it is, isn't it? No worries at all. And so, so Joe, let me, sorry, go ahead. Okay, I think uh, Joe or John, I think it was more so directed at, at Joe there. So Joe, if you wanted to kick us off or have Mr. Anderson. Yeah, no, sorry, can you, sorry, can you repeat the question again for me? Sorry, I didn't. Yeah, say. let me just recap and make sure that John yeah, um, right John's page. with us. So, so um, John, I was just saying to Joe that uh, what I wanted to talk about is the microfossil record. Um, and I understand in terms of the ordering of the fossil record that um, both of you uh, and, and many other creationists as well rely on three main uh, mechanisms to uh, to explain the ordering of the fossil record, and that is uh, the um, environment, um, mobility, and intelligence. Um, so by environment, what I mean, let's just talk about the one at a time. Um, by environment, what I mean is that, you know, fossils like clams are going to be found on the lowest layers because well, they, they started at the lowest layers, like the bottom of the ocean. And so that's where they got buried. And then fish, and then as waters rise, amphibians, and then terrestrial creatures, and then finally things that lived like high up in the trees, like small mammals and birds. That's one of the uh, mechanisms that you guys think um, order or, or account for the ordering of the fossil record. Is that fair? Maybe I'll just ask uh, if, how about if I just, we just let Joe answer and then um, John, if you disagree with Joe's answers, then you can jump in. Is that something? Okay? Sure. sure. Okay. I would um, ultimately take issue with that as a, as a generalization, mainly because that generalization tends to come from people, including creationists, who would take um, the geological column um, as it stands and effectively say, this is the flood order. And, and put it straight in like that. I don't think that it works exactly like that. Um, for starters, as uh, several secular geologists have pointed out, the geological column doesn't exist anywhere on the planet. Um, when I was doing my degree in geology, <laughs> the um, professor, my overseeing professor, when we went to one particular location in Norfolk, uh, where you have effectively the Cretaceous chalks, which are touching the Pleistocene glacial deposits, so you're, you're missing approximately 60 million years in there. And I asked him, so how do we know where the rest of the geological column comes in? The essential answer was you need to go around the world and try and piece it together. And effectively trying to do that is like trying to take a book that has had no um, page numbers and has been spread across the world and you don't speak the language. So there's a huge amount of interpretation that goes into the geological column on its own uh, before you even start to piece it together, which has been pieced together to see life on Earth over millions of years. So I don't I wouldn't All say right. that it automatically I'm fits start me there, sir. Um, I'm, I'm very sorry to be rude. Um, I'm, I'm going to stop you there because the question I asked you was whether or not you thought that environment was one of the factors that are used to uh, explain the ordering of the fossils that we do find in the geologic column. And as to whether or not the entire geologic column exists, I have a feeling that Jackson is going to be able to uh, give you, I don't know, five or six examples of places where there are, where the entire geologic column does exist, but that's not what I'm here to do right now. I'm asking you a very simple question. My understanding is that whether or not, like, look, when I say geologic column, I'm not referring to the entire geologic column. Would you agree with me that there are layers of dirt as you dig into the ground, and as you dig deeper, those layers change, and you find different fossils at different layers? Do you agree with that? Uh, in essence, yes. Okay. That's what I mean by the geologic column. So when I use the word geologic column, you'll now understand what I mean, right? Yeah. Okay. I see where you're going. So you're coming from the idea purely of just, just effectively layers. I'm just talking about With layers. I'm saying there's an order as we dig down and consistently we're going to find certain animals buried closer to the surface than other animals or, you know, yeah, animals. Is that, is that fair? You agree with that? Mm -hmm. Okay. And one of the explanations for the order in which we find them is environment, right? Uh, so effectively, so you mean in terms of you're going to find marine fossils where marine fossil creatures were and plant fossils where plant fossils were and that kind of concept? No, what I mean, what I mean is that you're going to find, uh, you're going to find clams and, you know, animals that lived at the bottom of the sea at the lowest layers because they lived at the lowest layers before the flood. Mm -hmm. And then as you go up, you're going to find amphibians. And then as you go up further, you're going to find terrestrial creatures. And then as you go up further, 
you're going to find things like uh, things that lived in the trees, like birds and stuff like that. And that's one of the explanations, one of three major explanations that creationists like yourself refer to when we talk about the ordering the fossil record, right? Joe, Joe can I just jump in here? Because uh, A, I've got to warn you, my, my internet seems to keep coming and going. So while I've still got you on, um, I'll give you my experience with the geologic layers, no matter where you go. Let's take Murawai over in New Zealand, where I take field trips every time I go there, which has volcanic stuff at the top, magnificent volcanic formations, and then massive amounts of shale and uh, fossil bearing content, etc. Now, here is my experience, and I'm sure Joe will back this up from where he's, he is usually mostly. In that 3,000 feet of, of sediment that's there, here's what you find. Fossil pine trees fossil clams and brachiopods and fossil forams. Uh, but the interesting thing is that the, the trees are from a terrestrial environment. The clams, which are mixed in with them, are from a marine environment. And the forams and the radiolarians are only found living at 3,000 metres deep. Right mm -hmm. now, we have them mixed up. And my experience is there's no such thing as saying this will only have marine fossils in it this has terrestrial fossils it just doesn't work like that the real geologic strata are mixed in every case that i've been able to find them joe what do you say about that yeah and that's the that's the point i was trying to make you you have this picture of your sea life kind of creatures complex uh, simple to complex type creatures from the bottom layers going up and oftentimes you'll find um even even sometimes creation geologists effectively saying, oh, these are environments, this has been buried down below in the sea, this has been buried further up. But your entire geological column as a complete unit is turned upside down in the sense that you don't have mix, uh, environments that are solely, purely one environment or the other. You can find dinosaur stuff buried right next to fossil fish. So you have a mixed environment throughout the geological record. Okay, so what you guys are telling me is that there is no ordering to the fossil record, that it is not the case and it is not fair to say that you're going to find one type of creature at one layer and that if you go up a little bit or down a little bit that the types of creatures that you're going to find change. I think, that, me? I think that if there is going to be any uh, ordering in the fossil record, it will have less to do with environment and more to do with, A, the type of sediment that is able to preserve the creatures and or plants. For mm -hmm. instance, uh, coal seems to be, uh, or uh, one of the requirements for coal formation uh, seems to be the presence of clay. If there mm -hmm. is no clay, there's no presence of coal. So that means if, even if you have trees being buried where there's no coal pr uh, clay presence, you're not going to get coal. Um, likewise, if you study the way, way that water works, particularly when it's flowing, uh, different um, uh, different speeds of water. Uh, water already has layers in it. You have different currents, different layers of water, which is going to carry different types of fossils and therefore bury different types of fossils. So, so the only I'm sorry, I'm not sure I understand you. I understand your first point. I'm not sure I understand your second point. So what are you telling me with respect to uh, water? You're saying that that water changes in the way that water flows. Water uh, so already has. Water already that has it's gonna, it's gonna, you know, where there, there are different ways that sediment forms depending on the water flow. So, like, you can tell whether something's a fluvian or a lacosian or a, uh, an ocean environment based on whether or not it forms, you know, this type of ripple or that type of ripple. Is that what you're telling me? Is that no, that's the, not, the ways that you tell what kind of fossils it is? Not a, no, not that type of fossils it is, but the type of fossils that are likely to be preserved is going to be dependent on the type of sediment that they're being buried in. The type yeah, of the sediment. Type of sediment part. What's the, the second the, one you the said? Type of. Let me say the type of sediment that is being transported in water depends on things like the speed of water, the way mm -hmm. that the water is traveling, the volume of water that is in that particular current. So mm -hmm. when you look at the Jurassic sediments in northern Queensland, and John can comment mm -hmm. on this you are dealing with a predominant sandstone. Uh, so the trees that are buried inside not only are a massive log jam that cover uh, almost a third of Australia, but they are actually buried in preserved in silica next to boulders. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. no coal to be found there. So right. the only ordering I would say would be uh, that you can see is based more on the way that it's been deposited rather than an environment or indeed a, a, a sequence of life on Earth. Joe, okay, so you don't agree then, just, then, just a second, John, because I want to nail this down with Joe. So you don't agree then that if we looked at um, that if we look at a given environment, 
that unless the sediment changes in type, that the creatures that we're going to find at different layers are going to change as we go up and down. You think that that's not true and that it's only going to change if you see a change in the type of sediment, which would indicate a change in the type of water flow. Is that what you're telling me? Uh, well, you're still uh, effectively attributing the... So you you seem to be coming from the idea that you have different time frames in the different sediments. I never uh, said anything about different time well, frames. No, no, I want to no, know no, how you explain the fossil records ordering. The fossil. I want to well, know first off. I want to know. Tell me this. Let's just nail this down. Do you agree with me that there is an order to the fossils that as you go up or down in the layers of the Earth, that the types of creatures that you find will change. Whatever the reason for that may be, do you agree that that is a thing that exists in the world? Well, uh, can, I, can I just jump in here? Having lectured in geology, you have in your head an abstract view of the world that doesn't order. exist really out there. Hence, consult Professor Derek Ager, who's not coming from a creation perspective. And the sort of concept Joe's getting across, like remember Highway 30 cut that I take you to, Joe, mm -hmm. in Tennessee with both the polystrate trees and the coal, and as I found a, a section there where I brought back to Australia to get it beautifully prepared and presented from museum quality, I found brachiopods, marine brachiopods in the coal, along with the fossil trees, and just up the road there are fossil sharks. Now, you can actually start with the picture in the textbook of simple fossils up to complex, but all of that is a result of Charles Lyell, Nicholas Steno, the modern world, putting it in textbooks, in pretty pictures, and you asking questions about a world that doesn't exist. You're All right. So, sir, uh, Joe, I don't, no, I, I mean, John's well. asked the, or John's answer a question. Let me let me talk to him for a second. I'll get back to you. So, John, what you're telling me then, and I just want to make this crystal clear because we can go through piles and piles and piles of documentation that shows that there are different animals at different layers. You know this full well. Both of you know that there is a pattern of simple to complex from the Cambrian to the Cretaceous to the Mesozoic eras to today, that there are different animals found at different depths. Don't tell me that you don't know that. Are you telling me honestly that there's no ordering to the fossil record? Really? What you find is the ordering is a result of our brains using Charles Lyell's theories based on Nicholas Steno, who said the bottom layer got there first and away it went, and you end up with your geologic column, which Sir, is I'm not suggesting to you that the bottom said, layer got there first. Exist. Well, I, 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 want to I just want to jump in for the audience sake, though, because there was a little bit of crosstalk there. I'm not sure if the last sentence of John got fully heard. So, John, right, if you could reiterate, so, it's ahead, okay. John. John, if you could reiterate your last point there, then we'll throw it over to Mr. Anderson. Okay. Again. As I said, most people do not appreciate that if we go and we find a brachiopod, we label it as marine. Usually, if you're writing a paper, you will ignore the fact that it's found in coal because it doesn't fit your theory, right? And so it's the theory of the geologic column, which you're talking about, not the facts of where you find them. So you go to the middle of Wales and you'll find trilobites at the top. You come to Australia and you find them way down the bottom and all of a sudden you have to invent the Precambrian because it doesn't fit with the geologic view that you have of England, right? So these are theoretical constructs yeah. and you're asking questions about a theoretical world, not a real world. So, sir, let me be clear then. In the real world, not the theoretical world, if you dig down into the earth and you find fossils, as you find those fossils and in various places across the world, you are going to find similar fossils at similar layers. Those layers are going to be at similar depths. The depths are going to vary. The fossils are going to vary. But you're going to find an order in the real world, not in theory. In the real world, there is an ordering to the fossil record. Isn't that true? I'd suggest that's why we had to invent the idea of index fossils to help us do that. But then you have to invent your own index fossils for Australia versus Wales because you find it does not match. So the answer to my question is yes, there is a pattern, right? Uh, there are multiple patterns. Mm -hmm. All right. And that pattern is that there is a certain order in which fossils appear, right? 
Well, if no. you're going to try and order something, you have to have a preconceived idea in the way that you want to order them. Much like I'm if you're going to order your socks together. You, you know, because you're putting two different points together. The first one, you're saying there are creatures that, A, change between layers. Yes, there's no denying that. Okay, Thanks. but the moment there are creatures between layers, but the moment you try and argue that they form some kind of order, right? As in whether you want that to be simple to complex, whether you want that to be Australia to Wales or whatever you want to go, it is true that you can find um, certain creatures in one type of rock, certain creatures in another type of rock. But the moment you try and put that into an order, you're already buying into a preconceived idea, which is based on Charles Lyell's idea, based off of Nicola Stino's idea, as we've said before, where you are now applying an order to it. So changes of differences of creatures don't in automatically imply an order. Okay. I think we're I think we're close here. So, as a first step, you will both agree to me, you will both agree with me that there are different layers in the earth and that in those different layers there are different creatures. Right? Um well you you haven't said anything. I mean, that would be true regardless of how the rocks got there. That's right. That's right. I'm not even trying to say anything controversial. All I want you to admit is that there are layers and that in those layers, the different layers correspond to different creatures. Can you give me that no. at least? No, no, not correspond no. to different creatures. You're going to find different creatures in different layers, right? Well, go ahead to the point you're trying to make, though. My point, that's the, the, the point I'm statement. trying to make is there are different creatures in different layers, and I want you to agree to that so that we can move forward. Otherwise, we're going to go around here again. Um, like you guys are trying to deny that like I, I'm I'm flabbergasted, honestly. This isn't the, the, the fight that I expected to have with you. I'm flabbergasted at the notion that you guys would suggest that the that the uh morphology of the fossils that you find as you move up and down the geologic column do not change. Well, Whether, you guys right. I'm sure you have many explanations for it. Many the of the, many of the fossils, yeah. the morphology doesn't change. Right? You can find many of them, the fossils, the morphology doesn't change. You can sure. find stromatolites that are supposedly 3.7 billion years old, and you find them living off the coast of Australia today. And all okay. up and down through the geological column, they don't change. Right. Same so with for jellyfish, some of them, it doesn't change. Same, right? with, same with, you can go on. Sure. For some of them, it doesn't change. And for some of them, it does, right? Are you meaning change from one creature into another? or you I'm mean not asking you to accept evolution. All I'm asking you to accept is that as you move up and down in depth, that the creatures you find change. Come on, guys. This is an easy one. You know this. It is, it is an this. easy question, but the things you're implying are, first of all, that the bottom layer saying. that you think of got there first, followed by the next one, followed by the next one. Now, that's where I'm Joe and I would totally first. dispute what you're saying. I'm not saying it got there first. I'm just saying it's deepest. I'm saying there's no, certain this, kinds of you creatures. You are saying it deepest. got there first, then, whether you admit it or not. Deepest I'm not suggesting means first you, in the geologic mind. Sir, I'm not asking you to agree with me that it got there first. I certainly think that but you're free not to. All I want us to agree is that there's that you're going to find things like clams, for example, at the deepest layers. You're going to find... You find uh, them at the topmost you know, layers as well. You are going to find them on the topmost layers as well. So the, whole, the, the whole question is arbitrary. Deepest doesn't equal deepest in time. Nor right. does it necessarily you're going to find different creatures. Well, deep. A little bit of... I just want to make sure, Joe, Joe feel Go free ahead. to finish your thoughts. We'll Go throw ahead. it right back to you, Mr. Anderson. Go ahead, Go ahead Joe. So again, Joe. sorry, was that... I just wanted to hand it to you, Joe, if you wanted to finish your thoughts there and point. I just want to make sure. Oh, I was only just saying the fact that you're, you're, you're deepest. When you say deepest, you don't doesn't necessarily mean deepest in time, nor does it mean deepest in actual um, reality, because you sometimes find the deepest rocks are on the surface, right? Mm -hmm. So the only way you they become the deepest rocks is when you take those rocks and put them into a philosophical construct, which is the geological column, where mm -hmm. they become the deepest rocks based purely on the idea that the bottom layer got there first, the top layer got there last. So even just using the terminology deepest refers back to that philosophical construct. Sir, I'm not asking you to accept that philosophical construct. I'm just, we are stuck here on first base where you guys won't admit that there are different animals that you find at the deepest layers than the ones that you find shallow. Yeah, and, yeah. And, and you know what? In any the given, in any given just let me finish my question before try and answer it. I'm still talking. Thank you. In any, Jill, in any pile of dirt, if you find there are particular creatures 
that if you find them, they're going to be deeper than other given creatures, right? Consistently. Isn't that true? No, because you find these creatures throughout the geological column. We've already made that point. So, so you're sir, not you're, dealing you're with deepest here, creatures you're tell necessarily me, being at the top. All right, you're going to sit here and you're going to tell me that it is equally likely for us to find a mammoth skeleton at a depth that is, let's say we find a mammoth skeleton and a tyrannosaur skeleton in the same column of dirt. You're going to tell me we're going to be equally likely to find the mammoth skeleton at the bottom and the tyrannosaur skeleton above it as vice versa? Is that what you're going to tell me? Well, Joe, I've never found a mammoth skeleton. I, I wish I could. Not. But I found plenty of beds where that no matter what strata you think you're in, the fossils are mixed environments. They are land, sea, and deep sea, mixed environments, no matter where you are. So your whole construct you're trying to get is messed up right from the start. All right. You know what? Let's do it this way then. Johnny, can I share a screen? Sure. <clears throat> and I'm looking at the clock. <clears throat> you got about six yeah. more minutes, Mr. Anderson. Well, I mean, you know... It if uh, if you if if you want if you want me to actually get to the points that I wanted to discuss rather than us discussing whether or not there is such a thing as layers in the geologic column, then you're going to need to give me more time. But that's entirely up to you. Hey, hey, we started with layers. You moved on to changes within layers and deepest to top. That's where we got hung up. Well, here let's get unhung up then. So you'll agree with me that there are different creatures at the deepest layers, however they got there and whenever they got there, and then there are different creatures as we go up, right? No, Come that's on, what we've been arguing easy. over over the past 10 minutes. <laughs> is that what I said true? Can we move on? Basically, it's not true. It's your interpretation <laughs> based on Lyell, based on Steno. Okay, well, we're going to have to do this the hard way then, you guys, I guess. So, uh, yeah, Donnie, let me share a screen then. I mean, this is foolish, you guys. But all right. If you're looking to share a screen, Mr. Anderson, just let me know when I don't see it at the bottom yet. And um, <clears throat> I'm just letting people know who's backstage. Uh, we're going to have priority with, with those that are skeptics. So Jackson Rose on deck. Then we're going to be throwing it back to John for a short presentation. And then I've got uh, a, a few others backstage. So uh, Anderson, I do see it now. All right. Put it Go on. ahead. So you guys... You'll agree with me that whenever we find one of any of these creatures in the same level of dirt, as in the same column of dirt as any one of the other creatures in this list, that the ones on the bottom of this list are going to be the ones you find deeper in the dirt. Can you, can you blow that picture up at all any bigger? I don't I'm know. struggling to see it on my screen. Maybe oh. zoom in if you can. But if oh, there that's we go. better. That's, that's it. That's better. better. Yeah. yeah. Okay. There you go. So you got yeah. Right. So these yeah, right guys. Wikipedia index fossils. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So what I said is true, isn't it? So what were you saying that the bottom layers? You're I'm saying that if you look and you dig a hole in the dirt, you find any two of these creatures, that those two creatures are going to appear in this order. Right. Ninety nine point nine nine times out of a hundred. Right. Um, let, let me comment on where I am sitting right now. I'm sitting on top of metamorphic rock, uh, which is regarded as uh, Carboniferous, Silurian, Ordovician, depending on which book you read. And uh, it's intruded by granite about 30 kilometres away, which uh -huh. is the same age as the volcanic tuff right alongside of it and sitting on it. By the Sir, I'm going to stop you right there because you're not going to find any fossils in either of those kinds of rock. One is metamorphic and one is igneous. You find fossils in sedimentary rocks, so I appreciate an answer to my question. Well, you're actually you wrong. An animal, oh, I, 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 I'm going to do it. Hey, hey, Mr. I just want to make sure John can finish his thoughts. John, we'll throw it back to you. Go ahead. You're absolutely wrong because it depends on the grade of metamorphism because I dig up trilobites out of the metamorphic Silurian uh, and they're still preserved. The metamorphic rock contains graptolites and all sorts of things where I am. But you'll find when you go up a bit further, you find the coal sitting on top of it regarded as uh, Triassic. And then all of a sudden you're at the surface of the ground. Uh, yeah. We're here. 
Now, Sir, that's are you really normal, afraid of this question? Like normal stuff that you find unless you do what you do and believe in that diagram, which is not the real world. So, sir, have you so, sir, are you really that afraid of this simple admission that these fossils, if you find any two of them in the same hole, that they're going to appear in this order? I, you they run from that question. You refuse to answer it four times now. They do in your diagram, but in the real world, you find sediments mixed with uh, trees and, and, and deep sea creatures and, and clams all together. So your yeah, diagram is too sir. oversimplified. Sir, it's very interesting. It doesn't answer the very simple question I asked you. I'll ask you again. If you were to dig a hole and you were to find any two of the creatures on this list, they're going to appear in the order you see on this list, right? No. Really? That's that's an interpretation. It's not a reality. Okay, so you don't believe that there is any order to the fossil record then? That order is an interpretation based on already existing concepts of how the that's rock That's interesting, goes. sir. It's still not responsive to my question. I asked you a simple question. Do you believe that there is an order into the fossil record? Yes, but not your order. Oh, not my order. So you don't believe that this order that I'm showing you on this screen, you don't believe that this order is an order that you're going to see in the ground? No. Well, you're not much of. It it you know, I, I, I don't know why we should we should we should listen to anything you say when you're not even uh, uh, able to admit. Uh, like these are basic facts, so I, I'll ask Joe then. Maybe Joe, you'll give me a more responsive answer or a more useful answer, sir. Uh, can you tell me whether or not you're going to find an order to the fossil record? Not that order. <laughs> We're going Not around in order. circles here because if you dig a hole and you find a fossil which matches a fossil in another place, your automatic assumption is that it is going to be of A, the same layer, B, the same period in time. So you're instantly putting it into a system which is based on time. So your order is based on time in the first place. All right. Let's try this one more time, sir. Let's say, let's give a particular example. Donnie, can you put that back up on the screen again? Sir, if I find, uh, for example, I find a pectin gibbous in a hole, and then I keep digging, right? And I dig down and down and down, and then I find Paradoxides pinus, uh -huh. right? I'm going to find, I'm not, I'm not going to be digging 99.999 times out of 100. When I dig that hole, I'm going to find the pectin gibbous first, and then I'm going to find the paradox. Uh, Paradoxides pinus, right? Not necessarily. It depends where you're digging. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I see you'll 99, find it, 99 sometimes times out of 100. Right. Right. Hey, 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 Mister, a little bit of, I want to make sure Joe can, can finish his points. Uh, I'm going to hand sir, it to you, Joe. Feel free yeah, to address sir, this. Nine, sir, sir, 99 times out of 100, you're going to find the pectin gibbous first and then the paradoxides pinus, right? Okay, no. over to you, Joe. No, because you can start digging the hole and find the pectin and then you can find Precambrian rocks and you're got no fossils at all other times you don't find any of the pectin and you go down and you find the paradoxy so the only way you're going to actually piece them together is if you assume that the so-called as you said many times deepest fossils got there first based off of an interpretation that is based on time and simply then piece them together so sir you're telling me that i'm not going to consistently find the order of index fossils which is a i mean like, you understand that, that this is an extremely well-documented uh, uh, phenomenon, right? And can I make a comment? You no, sir, I any... don't think so. I, 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 I I'm, I'm going to jump in, Mr. Anderson, please. I want you to respect the guest. He wants to make a comment. We're at 30 minutes anyways. Yeah, I, I, we have to um, move on, Mr. Anderson. I gave you right, 30 you know minutes. What? Well, let's, let, me, get let, me the... have, let me have one more turnaround on this then, okay? Okay, but Let's I want to respect you. Let me Mr. share. Mr. Please thing, stop interrupting the, the moderator, okay? I'm trying to moderate right. here. I'm trying to keep things organized. John wanted to say something. John, go okay. ahead, my well, brother. My take final your time comment and is the best evidence you've shown today is that you've never dug a hole, found an order of fossils, or been to a conference on where strata boundaries are, and so you're ignorant rather than knowledgeable. You're well mm -hmm. presented, but ignorant. Mm -hmm. Thank okay, you, sir. Mr. Anderson, All right, go ahead. one more time then? You All get right. one more, one more point, one more question. We got to move on because we're not going to be here I all night. We got about seven guests. To get Go ahead. I appreciate it. All right. 
So, sir, here's a diagram from a paper of somebody who has actually dug a hole, who is actually educated, who does actually know what they're talking about. And here are a whole bunch of different fossils. And there's an order. You can see here what says ranges of stratigraphically important foraminifera. You see that? Sir, you see that? Are you talking to Joe or me? Or both of us. I'm just I'm trying to talk to you, John. Up. I'm just trying I'm to talk to you. Yeah, that's fine. I see, I see the diagrams. I had them all through my geology course. Okay, lovely. So you'll agree with me that uh, you, I, I presume you take no issue with the notion that the person who wrote this article, which is published in a journal uh, called, uh, oh, I can't even find it, uh, which is published in a journal called Geological Quarterly. That's a respected scientific journal, isn't it? It's okay. Yeah, that's fine. But you okay. missed the point. You see, No, sir, I'm going to be the one making Okay, no, right I'm, 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 I'm jumping in. Okay, Mr. Anderson, you have 32 minutes. You're interrupting John. After, he's been sitting patiently waiting. We're going to give John the last word. we got to move to the next guest. So, Mr. Anderson, I appreciate it. John, over to you. You get the last word on. Okay, uh, again, I have to make one very important point. The guy who did that, bless his heart for digging holes, bless his heart for mapping forums, but he believes already in the geologic column, which is based on the concept that the rocks change content all up and down that's probably the best place to finish this so um over to your next yes uh, donnie okay well thank you very much uh john mckay for that final word there mr anderson i appreciate the back and forth engagement for 32 minutes that was good fast paced and uh very engaging so with that we are going to uh now move on to jackson Rowe who's been patiently Hello. waiting on deck. And again, I do see the other uh, skeptics backstage. Before I bring somebody else on deck, we're just gonna have Jackson Rowe engage for a little bit. And then uh, John, you're gonna give your, your brief presentation, then we'll start bringing more people in. So Jackson, brief introduction. And uh, actually you just got back from a trip. You had an in-person debate with Dr. Dino, lots of fun. And so how have you been? Yeah, go ahead, Jackson. Yeah. All right. So about finding marine and terrestrial things together, uh, you you do sometimes. I've only done. I've, I've been to a lot of fossil sites in Arkansas and one now in Alabama. And uh, I've only found one fossil site where I could find terrestrial and marine things together. Like the rule seems to be that's that you find terrestrial things in one spot and marine things in one spot. For example, I found a, a ridge near near me, like 20 minutes away. It's got these Chordites. It's got these uh, Calamites by the hundreds, but uh, never any marine fossils there, and uh, never any, let's say, bamboo or oak leaves or modern plants. So it, it's the same for Northwest Arkansas, the Fayetteville Shale. It's all marine. Never found any anything like uh, a plant fossil there. Uh, same, the Eocene of Arkansas and the Eocene of Alabama, it's all marine. The one exception was an Archie Creek, which is about an hour north of me. I found like 99% marine fossils, but then I found a couple of these, uh, uh, Cordites leaves in some, in some shale. But that was the one exception to that rule. So, uh, what, what do you guys think of that so far? Jeff? Jeff? Well, um, you find that the, well, <laughs> in the nicest way to say it is that, um, and I'm very blessed to have been doing this for a number of years now where I have traveled extensively, both across the US and the UK and Australia, uh, as well as many other places in, in, in Europe as well. And um, you could start reeling names of deposits off. Solnhofen is a very good example of marine and uh, terrestrial environments that are mixed together. Jurassic Coast down in the UK, again, you can walk along the base there and and many, many people who have no background in geology, purely amateurs, just fossil hunters, walk along there and you find heaps of wood buried next to ammonites. It is, in essence, the norm. Um, you can do the same with the rocks, the Jurassic rocks in Australia. You can do the same because if you come slightly further along from that deposit that you were describing with the Equisetum and the like in to where we were in Tennessee, just the sort of the next sort of state along, it's the same deposit, the same uh, Mississippi and Pennsylvanian deposit. I think it's Pennsylvanian. It's yet. Yeah, 
uh, upper carboniferous, um, you'll find there are sharks buried next to these. So going a little bit wider than just one or two deposits is a, a, good, a good idea. Fair okay, enough. I'll add a comment here, Joe. One of the things that our friend is missing is if I find buried equisetums or buried leaves, I have to stop and say, if this is a terrestrial deposit, how did these get buried? In every case, it's flood deposits that mud has come in, covered up the equisetums to the whole depth, 20, 30 feet, 10 metres tall, and then preserve them. So you have a watery deposit and you have no idea if it's salt water or fresh water, except when you're like me and you find brachiopods in with the coal, along with shark's teeth just at the other end of the, the, um, the, the coal deposit. And the re in reality, most of what you're saying is superficial investigation so i'd encourage you go back and and plot your area in squares and then check up the microscopic fossils are they marine forams terrestrial forums what are they but forget the idea of having fossils from a terrestrial environment unless you build in a flood dumping over the top of that to preserve the equisetums etc all right let me, let me talk about micro fossils since, since you mentioned Either way, if you take the uh, the ecologic zonation or the hydrologic sorting model, uh, it, it seems to me that you're, you, you know, con, con, conodonts are, that have the little teeth, they, the microfossils, conodont teeth, they're from the Cambrian, the Triassic, which doesn't exist apparently, but anyway, they're from the Cambrian to the Triassic, and uh, sharks have dermal denticles, which are about the same density and size. And they sharks will shed millions of those in their lifetime, and there are billions of sharks in any one time. So you would expect to find both conodont teeth or elements, they're not true teeth, but conodont teeth and uh, shark dermal denticles in like the Cambrian. But when you look at microfossils of the Cambrian, you never find dermal denticles. Why would you think that would be? Joe, any comments? Are you, so you're the you're let me just check check that you've got the the thing like you the 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 question is effectively if you've got it all from the same flood why don't you find shark teeth or dermal things in the in the in the Cambrian effectively if it's all the same mixed type uh, well, of environment not, not exactly it's you should find conodont conodont teeth and shark scales together because they're essentially identical in density, size, and they even look kind of similar. And of course, sharks live all over the, the world. There's not really an environment in the ocean they don't live in. So you're th you're you so that you're th you're going from the the idea is that you would have fossils buried based on their density. So if you find things of the similar density, then you should find them buried together in the hydrologic sorting model. But it also applies to uh, eco uh, ecologic zonation because sharks live everywhere in the ocean. Can I suggest that our listeners, um, if they want to follow up on how sediments get there, go to our Jurassic Arc dot, uh, our creation research dot net and look up strata machine experiments because what you've got is three or four things happening here that you're lumping into one thing. You're killing the sharks, you're, you're having their teeth fall out, you're having the conodonts, and you're then mixing them up and dumping them in the same place based on density. Now, that's such an outdated idea, it doesn't even warrant too much of a, of a reply. But if you want to I'm see... Saying, I'm not sure we've ever claimed like, that it's based on dense density. If you want to see what a flood is like, have a look at our strata experiments where we introduce different density stuff and then fl we flood it along and you find one thing. The uh, strata is within a fraction of a, 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 an instant of leaving a source and it's already sorted. It really it is fascinating to watch. But in Noah's flood, you would not only have the fountains of the deep breaking up to start with, you'd have rain uh, coming down, you'd have two tides a day, you have hundreds and hundreds of events in a year, um, drowning, sorting, all of those, and your sharks, of course, are still swimming happily around in the sea. Now, when you have a look at the fossil record, 
uh, despite the fact that it would be true if you take the Cambrian rocks, you don't find any rabbits, as Mr. Dawkins says. Why is that not the case? Why don't you find sharks and conodonts? Well, frankly, I haven't got a clue in some of these as to why you don't. But I can tell you where you do find them. You find whole sharks, not just the teeth, whole sharks in the Kentucky coal fields, buried with the plants that are terrestrial. And the, and as I said, my, my spe fantastic specimen of a brachiopod mixed in with the ferns. So that is the reality of what you do find dealing with not what you don't find, but what you actually do find. All right. I, I found uh, about, about brachiopods. I found three species of brachiopods in uh, one area of the Fayetteville shale, shale which is Carboniferous. And uh, they were identified as all being endemic to the Carboniferous. Like, why, why are there no brachiopods from the Eocene in there also? Joe, you want to comment on how we classify it as the Carboniferous? You didn't hear me? Well, perhaps I will then. He's when you say we found them endemic to the Carboniferous, number one, we've got the reverend gentleman in England calling the rocks around Newcastle Carboniferous because they've got carbon in, and they've also got brachiopods and things like that, even though it's a coal bed sequence. And you actually use the brachiopods to determine where you are in the coal because I lectured to the Newcastle Coal Board in England and took them out and we did fossil studies on the, using the layers of fossils to determine where you are in the geologic column. And the reality is if you say it's endemic to the Carboniferous, you mean it's found in a particular area and that is classified as Carboniferous, so you lump them all as living at the same time. In reality, they're dead in different layers in the same area. That's the fact. All right. Now, my next thing that I, I have written down that, that kind of bothered me was about the geologic column and how you, how you guys were saying it can't be found anywhere. And are you aware of the, the Williston Basin? Mm-hmm. You are? Uh, there are about 20 or 30 other examples like that. But the Williston Basin has Precambrian to basically present pretty much every, every everything is there. And it's in order as you would expect it and uh, they've done they drilled cores and found fossils in these cores and they you know they found cambrian and ordovician trilobites they have found uh carboniferous era or devonian era rather conodont teeth and they found plant fossils up up higher that are endemic to that area so not only are the layers in line in, in this spot but the fossils are too. Are you asking a question? Oh, I'll just make a statement. Well, it was kind of a statement, but I mean, what are, what are your thoughts on that? Okay. Number one, you will find that when you drill those holes down, you do find order, no doubt about it, in that hole, right? You can't drill that hole here in Queensland where I'm sitting because you've only got three layers and, and they're scattered left, right, and centre. But if you actually ask the next question, because our next step is to say this represents six, seven hundred million years from the top of the Precambium up to the present, whatever is, is there. I can't remember the exact details each year since I've looked at that drill call. But you'll find that if you then ask two things, one is what percentage of the actual geologic column is there? And the standard answer was, well, every bed is there. No, wrong answer. When you actually say, let's take the amount of rock that's there, X kilometres or whatever it is, divide it by the supposed time, and you will find that 98% of it is missing. Yes, we have layers that you can put in order based on the fossils, but you'll find the percentage of rock that's there is minimal compared comparatively. And so, therefore, please don't say that we've got rock that represents hundreds of millions of years of geologic column or geologic history because not even the complete columns have any more than a couple of percent of supposed history. The rest is missing. If you don't believe me, take the depth and then say, if this represents 600, 800 million years, whatever you want it to do, and divide the depth by the actual 600 million years and ask how much rock was laid down each year, and you'll find the answer is less than the size of an oil molecule. So the time is not represented in that, at that column, no matter what you do. That's what Derek Ager is famous for. And even though he was not a creationist Christian, the reality is I admire that guy because he stood there and he said, 
Here we have this much rock. It represents this much supposed time. Divide one into the other. And the answer is plainly ludicrous, quote unquote, from his book on the new catastrophism. And I'd really recommend our readers grab a copy, uh, Derek Age, A New Catastrophism. It's worth looking at. Uh, do you believe the, the depth might have something to do with erosion and deposition rates, like they might be different over different times? Well, the thing is that being involved in field geology so much, it's fairly easy to pick erosion. If you wander around here at the moment on the top of the metamorphic rocks that I'm sitting on, you can tell erosion because there are hills, there are valleys. And even if I covered all that up with a flood, I would still largely preserve the geomorphology of the land underneath. But what you find is the top layers are unbelievable. They just merge one into the other. And you can actually establish because there's no oxidation at those boundaries. There's no production of uh, iron oxides or soils or anything like that. And so you are not looking at deposit, then massive erosion, then deposit, then massive erosion. You can rule that out. And that's how Derek Age reached his position. There is no evidence of time in these rocks. These rocks here are, are well, ludic ludicrous results if you want to see check for time. All right. So the, the layers are kind of mapped out when they're not in perfect order, like the Williston basis, Basin. They're kind of mapped out it, like uh, on geologic maps in the U.S. I don't know how they do it in Australia, but you can go to uh, any area like you can go to the Eocene of eastern Arkansas. There's this little narrow strip and find anything and it fit and it fits there. Like I found this this clam, I didn't know what it was. It turns out it's called Venericardia planicosta, and it's only found in the Eocene. What are the odds, do you think, of me finding it in that narrow strip of exposed Eocene strata of eastern Arkansas, and not, say, the exposed Carboniferous strata? Let's forget the fact that you don't think they're different ages or whatever. Just what are the odds of that? Okay, uh, perhaps a couple of things, and then Joe, you can throw in a comment. I ask, first of all, how did it get to be Eocene? And the answer is when Charles Lyell started to dominate the geologic thinking, number one, his philosophy was get rid of Moses. Number two, start classifying the rocks on the basis of the fossils that were in it. Number three, invent words like Eocene, meaning that, you know, the, the, new, the new dawning uh, sort of uh, formation, and then use a fossil that you select as an index fossil and then state wherever you found that, it must be Eocene. Now, there's four steps there away from reality. The reality is the first Eocene was where Charles Lyell declared it. He wrote the definition. Everybody follows it from then. So wherever you find that that nice plenty cost us, you say it's Eocene. Well, see, the, the problem with that is I knew it was Eocene. I didn't know it was plenty cost. It could have been anything. Yes, it could have. But it's Eocene because it already had that stuff in it. Well, I don't think they they map every piece of land in the U.S. out like that. I think they, they do. They do certainly they certainly label them on the basis of fossils because you you go and do your masters, you do your PhD in geology, and you learn how to classify something, and you look for index fossils, and you don't worry about the rest of them. You look for index fossils, and you list it on your geologic map. One of our guys in the USA. He was sent out as a, a young geologist and he had to map the Cumberland Plateau and he wanted to know who the expert was. And they said, well, from now on, it's you. So he would then consult the fossil sequences and whatever he found, he would use that as the indexing for the labelling there. But the point that this debate sort of got sidetracked, we're dealing with the evidence in rocks. Now, none so far has pointed to any evidence of evolution. It has definitely pointed to rapidly covering up fossils, terrestrial fossils particularly, and you and I need to sit down and say, no time, rapid fossils, no evolution. Where do we go now? I mean, I mean, I feel like we're kind of at the end of our rope with this conversation, this line of uh, the fossils in order and, and stuff. Good, Joe's back. I have one more thing to, to ask them. Okay, so, it's yeah, about... It's good to have you back, Joe. Go ahead, Jackson. Uh, okay, uh, Joe talks about feathered dinosaurs quite a bit, so I, I have uh, something to present real quick. Let me see if I remember how to do this. Hang on a second. Okay. Tell, tell me when you see that. 
I see it. All right. This question is uh, for Joe, but uh, John also. Now, would you classify this as a bird or a dinosaur and why? I'm just trying to pull my screen up a little bit. Let me zoom in. That's all right. No, no, you're fine. Well, that's too far. Okay. Okay. Well, I could probably sure, honestly say there's not enough information just on the picture to determine that, but I'm just trying to look right. at some features. I think that's the kind of my point. Very, because well, the way you guys, the way you guys seem to to uh, catalog bird or dinosaur is whether it has feathers or not. That seems to be the biggest thing. If, you, if it has feathers, you guys still automatically say it's a bird. But when I put this up, you really ha you have to have to pause and think about it. Now, what if I showed it's you this? A, it's a very grainy picture on a very no, low quality screen. This. We try and look at more than just a picture. Right. But what about this? It has panaceous feathers. What would that make this? So this is, is this on the same fossil? It is the same fossil. Okay. Oops, no, I've lost it. I'll well, sorry, I'll, I took it down. But oh, that's not. it's the same fossil. So seeing that now, what would you describe the skull? Well, just from the outsets of it, just from what I've seen, that looks like a, a fully formed feather. Um, you could see the striations where I'd assume there were barbules, but I prefer to have it in hand um, before I, I made a definitive conclusion. But um, I would say that that would be a, a feathered bird for sure. Your All comments, right. John? Well, I can see the feather separately. I can see the skull separately. I can see the diagram of the skull. You and I don't even know if they're connected. Well, I was assuming that they were, but yes, that's well, true. They are. As well, they uh, are. You can, you can trust me on that. It's from the same fossil. Mm -hmm. they're, they're connected. Okay. The point is, if we conclude it's a feathered bird, right, in reality, uh, we haven't got anywhere in terms of where it came from. You found it in the rocks just like somebody else did, found it just like that fully formed. Um, that's one reason I ceased being an evolutionist, because every fossil I found was fully formed. And my professor, Professor Carter from Cambridge University, said that's how the whole rock record is. They first appear and they're fully formed. Uh, no evidence of evolution, regardless of whether you think it's a feathered saurus or a feathered bird. All right. Well, that's just kind of the, the point I wanted to make. So so I'm, I'm pretty much done with my my time. We, we can hand it over to the next the next guy. So, All right, ja Jackson, as always, I appreciate your time. Yeah. Thank you for keeping it cordial and professional and giving me an easy sorry, job. I, sorry, moderate, sorry I missed a lot of it. I was, <laughs> I was <looking laughs> it, we'll have to get together again someday. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Well, Jackson, appreciate you joining us. And so that now uh, completes our first two guests. So we're moving along smoothly. I've got several backstage and an order yeah. of how, how guests are going to join. But John, before we bring in the next guest, we're going to hand it to you, brother. Mm -hmm. For Bring my screen up, please, Dan Donnie. You know what, John? I think because... You lost oh, connection there at the beginning. I think we might have lost right, the screen okay. share. Okay, let's see you if should... we can do this. Joe, I may need your instruction here. That's fine. You should um, just be able to go to present and share screen and then bring up your yeah. PowerPoint. That's right. We'll do that. Okay, are we there? Let's see here. Are we there? No, I, I don't see it yet. Did you click okay. the entire screen? Yeah, I'll bring the entire screen up again. Don't you just love the internet? Is that up now? <laughs> not yet. Is that not yet? So, yeah. okay. I, I, I can walk you through it though, John, if you'd like. Um, all right. Just, well, I've got my full slides up, and I've got them on home. I've got them on uh, slide screen, show. Yeah. So if you come, if you come through. back to us, John, if you go yeah. Windows key, there come back are. to us. You need to click on present, and then yep, share. There we screen. are. Down, oh, okay, so that's what went off. Everything else is mine. Share yeah, screen. Yeah. There we are. Share screen is right. Um, Windows. Okay. Are we there now? Yes, we look good, John. 
Okay, good. Well, there's young Joe and uh, young John and old Neanderthal there. That's one of our themes and uh, creation research. You'll see our main website at the bottom there, which has just been upgraded. I'm going to try and give you a fast trip through what we do with the evidence. Here's Jurassic Ark, called Jurassic because uh, the rocks there have the same fossils as the Jura Mountains. We're in Australia. We're on the east coast of Australia, and these beds occupy at least a third uh, of the eastern side of that country. Uh, and our theme often is time is short, no evidence of long time periods. And we have public events and we have the world's only um, sundial made out of a petrified tree. We have heaps of dinosaurs, kids love them. We even have intelligent, um, you know, artificial intelligence, the dinosaurs pop out and uh, the kids love it. Um, we have a curator up there, several degrees, as well as being a missionary. And uh, we have lots of displays. Kids love this one. And uh, they like to use it as a photo op because it does reveal something about history that most of us ignore. I certainly didn't even know about it by the time I'd finished my university degree in geology. OK, see the scuba diver for scale? Um, we got the guys to do us a artificial intelligence um, you know, that you can just make that shark appear for scale. You can see how big it is compared to the, the car. Now, it's been a popular shark for a long time, even though it's been reclassified lately. Um, there's the diagram that appeared somewhat like the one in, in Scientific American on the evolution of sharks. The giant carcaridon at the top, the present day great white shark, and you and me in the bottom left hand corner. And the topic was evolution. OK, now we make no bones about it. We present that view. Now, n not denying, we accept it by faith. I wasn't there when God created the heavens and the earth. I wasn't even there when Adam blew it. I wasn't there on the ark, and I haven't visited Ken's one yet. I was there before it was built. And now we're right down to the present. And the words we are using are devolution. Richard Dawkins hates it when I talk about devolution because he calls it all evolution. All right. Now, our whole purpose of Jurassic Ark is that to remind people there are plenty of opinions and theories, including the theory about the geologic column that disagree with the Bible about creation and the flood. But in reality, we love to remind you that that whole geologic column was really interpreted by Charles Lyell and that. And his aim was to get rid of Moses, get rid of the Bible. But the facts, he hasn't been able to get rid of them. So here's what I'm going to deal with in depth to, uh, uh, well, not really in depth because it's a short presentation. There's the standard textbook approach. Fish give it amphibians, give lizards, give snakes. Now, it's called evolution in the textbooks. There it is in nature, June 1999, the evolution of limblessness. Now, I don't know about you, but losing limbs, I wonder if evolution's the right word. Um, here's a friend I met the other night coming down from the office about 1.30 in the morning, and he was there sitting on the gate, a baby um, well, just a baby python, harmless, really. Their snakes are, uh, their, their tongues are wonders in how they actually smell and detect things. Um, most people, of course, well, they probably don't mind the tiny ones, but I suggested to my wife, we needed a new sign. Beware of the snakes, because I live out in the edge of the bush. We have quite a lot of snakes, but pythons are the most common. Here we are back at Jurassic Ark. There's our Tasmanian coordinator, Craig. There's me there standing beside our model of a giant goanna. Are giant sharks smaller sharks? Um, yep, fantastic model, but it's actually based on reality. There's Dr. Diane Eager, one of our biological researchers, touching the skull that was found about 180 kilometers from my house. Now, we know it's a giant goanna, because bone for bone, jaw for jaw, tooth for tooth, it's the same as the present day goannas. So there's the model. They build it up as a robot and uh, they actually portray it as a giant version of today's goanna. Here's a little bit smaller one. And yes, I've encountered these. And the first thing they do when you pop your shotgun at them because they're raiding your chickens is they climb up the tallest thing. And in my case, it was me. I still remember that stupid goanna trying to get up to the top of my head. Fortunately, most of them are a wee bit smaller. Hmm. But we have some of their supposed relatives that seem to have lost their limbs. This is my backyard, wet season. Look at him coming in. Yes, we have some big pythons. Um, there's last year's babes. Um, yeah, pretty things, I reckon, and fairly harmless. And you can pick them up 
and they won't kill you. They might strangle your neck a bit or your leg or your arm or whatever. But when you touch them and turn them over, you'll find they have miniature legs. Yes, all the structure for legs is inside and the skeleton, but they only have tiny ones exposed. And all they can use them for is not walking, not even crawling, but for grabbing hold of the back of the female when they mate. Now, putting it in perspective, we make no bones about it. We are trying to persuade you that the God who was there has told us the truth. Genesis 1.31, everything started out very good. And he does mention six days. God made the world very good. And he made each creature after its own kind. Now, that's not what I believe when I went to university. But by the time Professor uh, Carter had finished with us in our zoology and geology course, I had to agree that made more sense than the evolutionary one. Um, this bit I struggled with because it said the world started out perfect and then man sinned, so God cursed the ground, death entered the planet, and in other words, you couldn't die until man sinned. And the world changed from good to bad. Now, you'll notice the direction of the arrow. It's downhill from here. So I said to our artist who created this mural, by the way, it didn't happen by itself. We all know what the evidence of a creation is. There's the biblical picture, Eve uh, plucking the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And there is the serpent with legs. Now, why legs? Because God cursed the serpent and said, you'll never walk again. You'll crawl along the ground. Interesting statement. Please don't think she ate an apple because the first time the Bible mentions apple is in the fifth book, the book of Deuteronomy. No apples mentioned in the book of Genesis. But what's interesting is by the time you get to the book of Revelation, it cross-references what happened to Eve and it talks about the serpent, the devil, Satan and the dragon. Dragon, provably the old word for dinosaur. Dinosaurs had legs. Goannas have legs. Um, well, let's have a look. What can you say? I debated Dr. Michael Caldwell, and uh, he didn't do too well. The fossil record serves a historical test of change over time. I agree totally that certainly if you take the things in order as they are in the geologic column, they certainly show you a group of change. But the change is the opposite of evolutionary change. There's the BBC News. I picked that because that had the nicest picture for a comparative. Uh, Route Master, Double Decker Bus, London, and look at the size of the Titanoboa, up to 15 metres or 45 feet long. I got our artist to draw it for scale. There's a modern day croc, and there is you and me at the back, and that is some snake. In fact, there's an article that was in the Times one year about a, a snake that had legs, found a fossil of it. And they even had some great pictures of it. So I tracked it down. And certainly the fossil of a snake with hips was found in South America. And they named it Najash Rio Greener, April 2006 Nature. Najash Rio Greener, which takes its name, said the article in Nature and the article in the newspaper, which quotes it from the leg snake described in the Bible. Now, where would the scientists get the idea from? They got the idea from the book of Genesis. So please don't say Genesis and, and, and the Bible has nothing to do with science. It has everything to do with the science. That's where science started, the belief that there was law and order that you could detect and master your environment like God told us to. God told the serpent Najash, it would go on its belly all the days of its life. So getting a little bit closer, nature, 16th February 2006, there's the theme. Fossils tell us snakes evolved from predatory goanna types. Hey, they have lost their legs. So the history is not the one shown in the textbooks with an always upward sort of a concept, but it's the reality of that. Downwards, devolution, the word that uh, Richard Dawkins hates when I, I interact with him. It's a, a change by loss, change for sure. You can even find nature, and you can see uh, volume 464 there. They have an article on the genetics of loss, how they lost their legs. If you want me to summarize it, here's the kids' version. They used to be that big. They did have legs. Their legs changed in size. You can see, still, still see that happening in many lizard varieties until finally they lost their legs totally. And the interesting thing that article points out, the gene for legs is connected to the gene for the number of vertebrae in the backbone. Change one. You change the other. Hmm, interesting. Evolution, not a word I'd use. Change for sure. Evolution, no, nah, 
not in the way Darwin meant it at all. In fact, there's the point we've made over and over again. There are many theories that disagree with everything in the Bible, but the facts never do. The fact of the geologic column, even if you think those fossils are there in order, they do not help you with evolution. In fact, the rapidity you have to bury fossil lamellibranchs and that with to find them closed tells you that there's no time in the geologic column either. In fact, dividing the whole geologic column you find in the USA, I'm so sorry, that doesn't help you find millions of years at all. In fact, there's the biblical picture. The history of the Bible as Donnie will tell you, I'm sure he has, he can be as provocative as me, it's designed to actually lead you from the creator back to uh, the creator through the death of Jesus Christ and his resurrection. I guess you can say that's my concluding point before we throw it open to anybody. Your Bible is accurate from the very beginning when everything that God made was very good. Therefore, uh, hint, hint, wink, wink, go to our creation research website. I'll try and actually get back to us now. There we are. Okay, how do I do that? There we are. All done. And Donnie, oh. I did that all by myself to get back to you. <laughs> you did an excellent job, uh, John. I'm impressed. Uh, great presentation. Appreciate the visuals. And By okay. the way, um, I sort of keep glitching here and there and everywhere, so I hope that I'm not going to drop off again. Um, but uh, we, what are we looking at? A sort of a two-hour kind of program? Uh, I'm, I'm thinking about two and a half hours with the amount of guests we have currently in the back. How so, are you for that, John? Timing wise. And, and what we'll do in order to make sure we get through everybody is I'm thinking we're going to go, well, depending on the guests, about 15 minutes. Mm -hmm. uh, rather than the first two guests, we went a little bit longer. And so I'm going to bring in the next person to engage and then the one on deck. Okay. So doc, welcome. You're going to be up to engage. Andrew, you are going to be on deck. And so doc, good to have you a, a brief introduction. And then what would you like to uh, discuss? All right. Sure. Thanks for having me, Donnie. Uh, for anyone who doesn't know me, I'm doc Dino. I am a, well, budding paleontologist. I'm starting my career now. I have a degree in, well, paleontology uh, and currently cleaning fossils. So that's fun. Uh, I wanted to come on and talk to Joe about a topic he's talked about a few times before, that being feathers and if they're exclusive to birds. Mm-hmm. Okay. Johnny, can I just interrupt you a moment? I'll sure. duck down and check on my wife who's not well. I'll be back in a minute or two. Yes, take your time, John. No worries. Appreciate it. Okay, Doc. Well, thank you for the intro. Yes, you're, you're definitely no stranger to uh, debates nor uh, this topic. So feel free to uh, bring up your first point or question, and we'll have you and Joe engage. Sure. Um, I actually have a presentation I'd like to kind of go through uh, step by step. So I'm here to talk about a revelation I've had on feathers in the fossil record. Uh, I'd like to talk about how we recognize a dinosaur, how we recognize a bird, and how we recognize feathers in the fossil record, and eventually, if some dinosaurs might have had feathers. Not birds, dinosaurs. Now, I'm not arguing for evolution. I'm not arguing for deep time. And I'm not arguing about Noah's flood. For the purpose of this discussion, God created the world and its animals as distinct kinds 6,000 years ago. He flooded the world and created fossils 4,000 years ago. And he provided us with senses and reasoning that let us observe and analyze the natural world. You know, to, to do that, probably to better understand the glory of his creation. Regardless of whatever my actual beliefs are, that is where I'm coming from for this discussion. Can you, uh, is that about where you're coming from too, Joe? Um, more or less, that broadly describes it. Um, sure. All right. All right, good. I, I based it on uh, stuff you've said previously, so I was hoping so. Okay. Now, uh, I know you have training in paleontology, so this is probably easy for you. This is more for the audience. Uh, what is a dinosaur? Dinosaurs are a distinct group of reptiles and all of them have at least these four traits. 
they all have it in common. They have an open acetabulum, which is a big hole in between the hip sockets. Uh, they have an upright stance, meaning the legs are directly underneath the body. They have a special muscle attachment site on their hind legs called the fourth trochanter. And they all have an antorbital fenestra, which is a big old hole in the skull between the eyes and the nose. Does that sound about right? That would be the standard definition of a dinosaur, yes? Yep. Uh, yeah, I wanted to say kind of basic. All right. Up next is uh, what is a bird? You know, it's kind of relevant to the discussion. Uh, birds have their own combination of features that distinguish them from all living animals. All modern birds have toothless beaks, flight feathers, wings that cannot be used for grasping, a pigastyle, which is basically fused tail vertebrae, or just this big chunk of bone that they wiggle around to move their tail feathers. And their feathers are composed of a substance called beta keratin. It's kind of like the stuff that uh, your fingernails and hair are made of, but it's the bird version. And they are mostly darkened by these little cell organelles called melanosomes. Does that all match up too, Joe? Or sound about well, right? It depends on your definition of tooth, and it depends on your definition of grasping, but... Um... That would I've I've seen definitions such as these before for birds. Um, mm -hmm. I'm not sure what your where your point is going. We're we're getting to it. I'm just making sure you agree. Well, I didn't say I agree. <laughs> I agree. Mm -hmm. Oh, uh, what I guess what do you have a problem with? Well, it and depends on the definition of a tooth, birds. and it depends on the definition of a grasping. Um, we have birds today that have claws on feathers that are used for grasping, such as the ostriches. We have um, what has been described as sub-toothed beaks, such as geese and the like. It really depends down on your definition of this. Um, I'd say that well, these are uh, fairly broad categories. So I'm going by the, I guess, standard biological definition. A tooth is a specialized piece of bone. Well... Bone-ish, uh, composed of dentin, <laughs> surrounded by. I think, I think that's you've just proved your own point by using the word mm -hmm. "ish." There, there is no standard different biological definition. There are multiple different opinions ish within as, biology. Ish as but there's in, no standard not really biological bones. definition. Well, a little bit of crosstalk, Doc. I just want to make sure Joe can finish his point. So, Joe, well, go ahead, I, then we'll throw it back I to you. I think he Doc. misunderstood me, is all. Well, I'm just saying there's no there's no standard biological definition um in for oh. these things this is why the whole argument is there in the first place no we pretty well know what teeth are i was saying what you seem to be confusing is i was saying they're not really bones but they are another hard part of an animal um the standard definition for a tooth is a dentin structure covered in enamel usually used to either procure or process food. Do you agree with that definition? Is that the definition that you're using in this in this context? Because yes. that's all we're not doing any what I agree or not. It's what definition you're using in this context. I don't well, know what your point sure is. Yet. You agree with the definition. Now I'm gonna jump in, gentlemen, just because it'd be nice to have a full two hour debate, but because you know we're at the hour and a half mark, we got several to get through. Doc, if you could, can you as quickly as you can get to the point so we can discuss the, and I appreciate what you're sure. doing, but we, we sure. do have just, limited time, of course. Sure. Then Joe, can you just agree with these for now? <laughs> well, you're happy to present your point based on this definition. I'm just going with what biologists say. I learned this in my education. Mm -hmm. All right. So there are birds in the fossil record too. All fossil birds have at least one of these traits. Not all of them have all of them. So they have a short fully f or fully fused tail into a pig style. They have wings that can't grasp, flight feathers, and a toothless beak. Now, some, like Confucius Ornus, have all of these, whereas others, like Archaeopteryx, they only really have flight feathers. Right? But, and I've heard you say this in other programs, both of these are birds, correct? Archaeopteryx and which one? 
Archaeopteryx and Confuciusornis. Mm-hmm. I think you also agree Microraptor's a bird, but if you don't, then I apologize. Settled for the first two, Joe. We won't get anywhere if you don't. <laughs> I'm sorry. So I was just waiting for the next bit. Sorry. My apologies. What, what am I agreeing to? Sorry. That they're birds. Just that they're birds. Yes. Okay. Go on then. Yep. Okay. So on these birds, and when we find like isolated feathers in the fossil record, uh, we see that feathers are composed of filaments. And depending on how well they're preserved, uh, they might have melanosomes, and they might even have preserved beta keratin. Again, that's what gives feathers their color and what makes up feathers in that order. Um, so like this one down here, this beautiful feather uh, has filaments, melanosomes, and beta keratin. It's a feather. The feathers on Microraptor have them too. Whereas this pretty obvious bird, Yanornis, it only really has smudges left. So these are what feathers mm -hmm. are. And now here we have this creature. This is Sinusoropteryx. <laughs> now it has all of the features that all dinosaurs have. That hole in its hip, walks upright, it's got that muscle attachment site, and a big old hole between the eye and the nose. Right? So it's definitely a dinosaur. But it's also covered in filaments that have melanosomes. We call the we usually call those feathers. And there are birds in the formation that Sinusoropteryx is known from, so with the same type of preservation, and their feathers look a lot like these. So, at least going from what we know about dinosaurs, feathers, because this is definitely not a bird, but it's a dinosaur with feathers. Do you agree that it is a dinosaur that has feathers? No, and you'll find that there are a number of uh, researchers that would agree at this point as well, including secular scientists. The concept of Sinusoropteryx having feathers, uh, or rather those indications, the filaments being feathers, was predominantly put forward by Benton in his original research. Um, and uh, you'll find that that has been contested by a number of secular scientists, uh, including, including, well, as well as some, I should say, um, creation scientists, uh, which have done similar or got similar examples with decaying collagen fi uh, filaments so, and fibers. So you are correct on that. There is a number of at least secular scientists. I found three. There is Alan Fiducia, and I can't remember the other two, but I found three. Mm -hmm. And every other paleontologist that I have seen give an opinion on this disagrees with them. And again, these have filament to structure and melanosomes. Collagen does not have melanosomes. Melanosomes are found in skin structures and internal mm -hmm. organs. And Indeed. these are well, on the surface of the body. Collagen, there's going to be skin to on top of it. If there's going to be collagen, there's going to be skin on top of it, particularly if this is a fossil which has started to uh, mummify before it gets buried, which you also find examples of of scale dinosaurs, which have uh, some of these um, uh, pigments in as well before they get fossilized, which don't, the collagen hasn't decayed to the same kind of, yeah. kind of point. Um, you so, are yeah. correct that we have scaly dinosaurs with preserved color or preserved melanosomes. Um but those are in scales. They're not mm -hmm. long filaments like you're seeing here. Also, there are a number of papers describing Sinusoropteryx remains. And all of them note that the line of, I'm just going to call them feathers, because I don't have a better word for these, because again, not collagen. They follow about where we would expect the skin of this animal to be based on you know, the size of its bones and how skinny it is, stuff like that. They follow Joe, the can I just, skin. Uh, Joe, can I just throw something in here, Joe? Um, 
you mentioned Alan Fiducer, and I've got to be honest, he would be at the top of the pile in terms of being a dinosaur slash feather expert. So I'd take a lot of notice of him before I took notice of some of your other people. But your mm. whole point here seems to be missing a direction. If you're trying to say dinosaurs evolved into birds, then this creature doesn't help you much at all. If you're trying oh, to say dinosaurs, some dinosaurs had feathers, did they always have them? Uh, you haven't made that clear at all because in reality the biblical position says god created birds at the same uh on the on, on the 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 um what is it, the fifth day and he created the uh, land creatures on the sixth day so the so birds john, if I may. before the land creatures if i may john you did miss the beginning of my presentation i'm not arguing for evolution i'm just mm -hmm. saying that feathers are not exclusive to birds because here we have a dinosaur with structures that fit the definition of feathers. And Fiducia does know a bit about birds and dinosaurs. But there are a lot of other paleontologists who are very well informed as well. And give better reasoning than Fiducia does. Uh, like I said, they looked very closely at these feathers with an electron microscope and other methods. I didn't say what tool they used, but they look very closely, and they have melanosomes. Again, that's not in collagen, like Fiducia claims. That is found in skin features and internal organs, and these are not inside the body. These are forming an outline. And so what is your actual point? I mean, that where are we going? This is a dinosaur that has feathers. Okay, you might that's end up all having I'm looking for. It as something that's not a dinosaur or not a bird. That's your other option that you're ignoring at the moment. And in reality, um, I can't see uh, to have that creature because we use this in our displays at our, our Disc Creation Discovery Centre, blow up the pictures, and the average person that looks at it sees fibres like producer does, right? So and, and that's what the average person sees. Oh, Doc, I, 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 the experts know better. Hey, Doc, I'm going to jump in. We, we will throw it back to you. I just want to make sure... John can finish his points, and then I promise you I'll throw it right back to you, He's Doc, if you point. disagree. With it. Okay. The John average thought. person from geologist down to layman on the blown-up pictures sees fibers, right? They do not see uh, anything else that even resembles feathers in their experience. And, in fact, having dug up some dinosaurs, and I've got feathers in my collection uh, from the USA beds over there on dinosaur digs, you do find feathers. I've got them from uh, the beds in, in the Solnhofen. I think you two have them, Joe, as well, trapped mm -hmm. inside amber. Uh, and you they are so totally different from what you see on Sinusoropteryx yeah. that I, I think you, your case is so far stressed, right. uh, it, so it's ignorable. John, John, you've made your point. And uh, you had an explanation earlier. You said it might be something other than a bird or a dinosaur that has feathers. Well, first, that would still be something other than birds that has feathers, but also it has all of the features we use in biology to classify it as a dinosaur. It has a hole in its hips that's found in T-Rex. It has upright legs like a brontosaurus. It has a fourth trochanter like a triceratops and an antorbital fenestra like a stegosaurus. It has all of these dinosaur features. It's definitely a dinosaur. And again, I'm not arguing for evolution. Evolution does not matter to this discussion. God created this animal 6,000 years ago. It, it ultimately, it the, discussion, it the, discussion, the discussion of evolution ultimately does come into it because as it was pointed out by, I think it was Mc, uh, McNamara, Mc, McNamara um, which may be on your list of people, but one of the people who contested that these were uh, plain as day feathers, um, his Research showed that the evidence of color and the shape of melosomes is affected by temperature and pressure. So any form of model or reconstruction that produces these or claims that these go into feathers needs to be, in his own words, treated with extreme caution. And the whole reconstructions and modeling that you use to uh, re reconstruct these as being feathers are ultimately based on evolutionary assumptions about past habitats uh, well, and, and leading into it. So your evolutionary assumption is there immediately to try and force the idea that there's evidence of feathers on sinusop sinusopteryx. No, not quite, Joe. You seem to be mistaken. So caution is required. That's why we're very careful. Again, looked at this thing with an electron microscope, and it has 
feather structures. It has. Uh, I would. I would question. I would question also, that because, evolution as far as I know, evolution there's been no transmission. Okay, I'm going to jump a little bit of crosstalk. It's pretty obvious there's some crosstalk. Joe, finish your thoughts. We'll throw it back to you, Doc. Well, Go I ahead. was talking. I know, but 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 Doc, you've dominated the 15 minutes with your presentation. Just let Joe address your point, I, and then you can uh, respond right after. We got a. I will take slide, issue with that because I know at least until last year, I haven't checked in the last eight to ten months. But I know at least up to last year, there has been no transmission electron microscopy done on Sinusoptrix for a very simple reason, right? TEM, transition electron microscopy, would be able to distinguish between bacterial structures and melan uh, melanosomes or melanosomes. Uh, and as to, as I say, as of last year, I can't remember the exact day that I last checked, but there's been no research actually done into this. Now, that would answer it very, very easily, whether it was either a bacterial structure or collagen structure, or whether it would be a stronger indication to feathers, and it hasn't been done. So, John, I hear what you're saying. That has been done before. It has been done. They are not bacteria. Well, I'd appreciate. I don't know. This is a, this is a genuine gonna... question. I'd appreciate a, a link to the paper or the research. That, and it's a gen. I'm not thinking. There's a genuine, mm -hmm. a genuine request. Gentlemen, sure. the, um, uh, I would. Sorry, uh, one minute, Donnie. One minute, and I'll be completely done. Uh, I will be happy to put a link to this presentation in the chat. Um, Donnie, if you put it in the YouTube chat, I appreciate it. Yep. There are links to relevant papers in this presentation. Now, just to finish up, again, this is a dinosaur with structures that fit def that fit feathers. They are feathers. There's nothing else they can really be. And that's not my opinion. That is based on evidence that has been looked at by dozens of very, very experienced paleontologists. And it isn't the only one. There's a lot of dinosaurs that have feathery structures. All right, Doc. I, I appreciate all. I appreciate that, Joe. Let's give you a, a final word if you'd like to. Then we're gonna uh, move to Andrew. Go ahead. Okay. Well, just to reiterate the point in in uh, that we made earlier that there are a number of people to to contest that Sinusoptics has feathers. But let me just finish on one point, and I'll let John uh, have a final say as well. Um, yeah, if you want to know this evolutionary basis, that certainly is there. You see evidence of this because I attended a lecture a number of years ago when I was in uh, university with Dr. Lomax, and uh, he said, quote, unquote, because I actually asked him the question, right? He had multiple depictions of large theropod dinosaurs covered in feathers, and I asked him, as far as I'm aware, we have very little in the way of evidence for large theropods having feathers. Um, so just wondering what, uh, you know, called, made you or what made you decide to, to depict these covered in feathers, sort of graphics and stuff covered in feathers. And uh, his exact um, response was, we assume that all large theropods had feathers because we know they evolved into birds. So you'll find you're directly back at this evolutionary assumption whenever you're trying to argue that dinosaurs had feathers. It was first proposed by Huxley within just a few years of Darwin theory of evolution who looking at archaeopteryx said there are features here which are distinctly bird-like there are features here which appear distinctly dinosaurian based on our definitions that we've given to them um, therefore this could be an example of a missing link now, even Archaeopteryx has been regarded by the secular scientists, and the research was done by Dr. Angela, I um, can't remember her last name, at the Natural History Museum a few years back, and it also had nothing to do with feathers. The research that they did it had to do with the brain capacity that they measured. And so there's more to the definition between dinosaurs and birds than purely feathers. John? Um, one last question, which will involve you, Joe. We ordered last year a complete um, cast of a fossil dinosaur uh, and it turned up covered with feathers and you got in touch with the guy who does the casting for the Natural History Museum to ask him why did you send it covered with feathers? What was the question you actually asked him? 
So this was a Velociraptor fossil, um, and we're not talking little filaments like you see on Sinusopteryx. We're talking full vein feathers on its wings. And I asked uh, the guy who had done the casting, he's a well-known company in the UK that produces for museums around the world. And when I asked him why it was covered in feathers, he said, well, we've had so many requests for feathered dinosaurs. Uh, and uh, like you see the models of in the Natural History Museum and like of these uh, Velociraptors and Dinosaurs, and the like, which are covered in large, almost primary wing feathers on their on their arms. Uh, and he said, the problem is we specialize in casts and we couldn't find any like that to cast. So he simply drew them on. <laughs> so you do, there is certainly an element of um, evolutionary presupposition, presumption, before you even get to, into looking at the evidence. Okay, and my uh, okay. final comment on this question will simply be, avoid the majority in science it almost inevitably gets kicked out in the end hmm. okay don he said you give me 10 seconds please pop up the thing i'm sharing on screen okay you get 10 seconds doc and then we got to move to andrew go ahead okay here's a 30 foot long carnivorous dinosaur covered in feathers uh also let's see gen one long for feathers on what or for why we should have feathers on velociraptor same size very close by covered in long feathers flight feathers i might add it should have feathers. Thank you, Donnie. Okay, Doc, thank you for joining. Uh, Joe, did you have a 10 second response or did you want to move right to Andrew? I think we'll, we'll, we'll move on in my opinion, unless John has anything else to finish. No, go ahead, Donnie. Okay, well, thank you, Doc. I appreciate that. Again, we're moving along smoothly. Let me get everything organized here. And I do like that we've had a diversity of topics here, feathered dinosaurs, fossil record, and now we've got Andrew. And so, Andrew, good to have you. I am interested to see what, what you're going to bring up in terms of arguments or topics. So real brief intro, uh, Andrew, and what would you like to discuss? Yeah, can you uh, hear me okay? Yes. Okay. Uh, well, thanks for having me on, Donnie. Uh, nice to meet you, John and Joe. Um, so I, I was going to originally present one argument, but I'm curious to hear your thoughts on this instead, because I think this is more relevant to some of the issues that were discussed earlier. Um, so a so question I have for you initially is, what, what, what issue do you have with Steno's law of superposition? What, why do you think it's false? Okay, I'll go in two directions and then Joe can take over. Where I have my house sits on rocks that are regarded as Ordovician now, right? Now, it used to be Silurian, and before that, it was almost Precambrian. Now, since I was at university when much of this sort of change happened, I know exactly why they've made the change. Initially, the geology in Brisbane, they could not find any fossils in this submetamorphic to metamorphic rock. And then a student on the north side of Brisbane found what looked like a portion of a trilobite. So all of a sudden, it was upgraded from Precambrian uh, and above. And then somebody found in a volcanic extrusion on the western side of Brisbane, a portion of this rock blown out of the volcano with a datable so-called crinoid in it. And so the layering of the rock had nothing to do with the age it was put in. They were using an evolutionary accepted history of fossils and that, and then going back and changing the age of the rock. The rock hasn't changed one bit. It's still in exactly the same position. Now, that's my that was my first uh, well, can introduction. Can I respond to that first? Yeah, that was my first introduction. Secondly, when I studied uh, stratigraphy and ended up lecturing in coal geology, etc., one of the things I observed was that when you went into the field, finding rocks and fossils and finding coal had nothing to do with your view of the history of the area at all. You drilled holes, you dug holes, and you used your clues about what rocks you were in to tell you where the, the, um, the, the minerals might be. Now, I actually ran a course for technical education on geological mapping, and I told the, the, the fellow staff at the end of the year, what do you think would happen if I leave out, left out millions of years in evolution? Oh, you can't do that. I said, it's too late. I already have, and we have some of the best students we've ever had. And by the way, they're now out being coal mining geologists and, and mine managers and that, and it works. 
you have to deal with the real world, which doesn't come in the nice, neat layers that are in the textbook. Okay, now, so, so, I, so I understand your point there about the fossils, and I appreciate mm -hmm. your response there, mm -hmm. but that doesn't really answer my question why you disagree with Steno's law of superposition okay. specifically. You're talking okay, about biostratigraphy so there, there, but not superposition. Historically, that led me back to what presuppositions am I using? If you've got to make up a new course, you have to deal with how did you get to where you are before you can teach students. So I ended up doing a real in-depth look at Steno and the thinking of the time. No doubt about it. A follower of Luther, a creationist, a biblical worldview, creation, Noah's flood, etc. But a, a medieval a pseudo Greek view of rocks and fossils. And if we can thank him for anything, it's belief that God made the world. God doesn't deceive us. So if we find a rock that looks like a shark's tooth, it's probably a shark's tooth as distinct from medieval Catholicism or Catholic uh, Greek thinking that it could have been a trick played by the gods to deceive us. So we can thank him for his big book on how to identify a fossil shark. From there, of course, he began to actually uh, think out the bottom layer got there first, followed by the next layer, followed by the next layer, followed by the next layer. Now, it wasn't too long before I came across a comment from another English, uh, sorry, from an Englishman who actually said, if Steno is right, and this is John Ray, the guy who's just as famous but unknown uh, for his work on the, the classification system that uh, our friend in Europe gets more clip credit for, Linnaeus. Yes. And he said, basically, if, if Steno is right, the world is too old for the Bible to be true. So if you think that the rock at the bottom got there first and then the rock above that got there next, then here's what follows. The creatures in the bottom had to live and die and get buried before the creatures in the next layer came along and lived and died and get buried. Right. Now, initially, Steno, of course, a creationist, that didn't even occur to him. He wasn't interested in dating, creation, flood, present day. So primary, secondary, tertiary, quaternary rocks, the four layers which have a biblical basis. No problem with that. Well, if if, if I may point go... something out here, initially you said that the ordering of the fossil record and the layers was based on an evolutionary worldview. Now you're saying Steno, who you're, you're saying was in fact a creationist, that yep. was not the case, that he found this yes. out by his observations. Does that not contradict no, what no, you no, said no, earlier? He, he actually, if I can correct you, he didn't find this out by his observations. That's why it's called Steno's presuppositions. He it's never went to see sediments, sediments, sediments being laid down. He assumed that the bottom layer got there first. How else would they be laid down? Well, that's why I suggest people go and have a look at our strata machine because the water in it. the world the water in the world is all flowing sideways. The sediment, therefore, is coming in sideways. Layers can only be laid down sideways if you are going to bring them in by water and you have no other way apart from wind and volcanic action that will get them. So all the, the layers in the world... The in that experiment are still laid down first. So superposition still applies. No, this is not the case because if you looked at our strata machine correctly, you'll see that the most dense layers actually end up on the top. Uh, and in fact, if you have a look at... Uh, our um, uh, European guy, the famous French guy, uh, who Guy did the, yeah, pla that's right. What was his name again, Joe? Guy Barteau. Guy Barteau. Yes. He's got an incredible experiment that I watched when I went, went to the University of Colorado geology section, a huge 50-foot um, flume tank in which he was showing that the, the layers just don't do what we've been taught to believe. The layer at the bottom, we assume it got there first. The layer so that's next, can I we assume my it screen came here, after it. Say that again. Uh, give me one sec. I'm going to sh share my screen here because I know who you're talking about. I've looked into his experiments. Many others have looked into it. And mm -hmm. while he did show that Steno's law of ho original horizontality isn't strictly true, that does not negate his law of superposition or the modern definition of the law of superposition. So can you see the diagram here Donnie. your well, voice you is very breaking up for me but that may just be my laptop i don't know if it's the same for anybody no else. It, it, um, i think you're starting to that. break up a little bit andrew now that you're sharing screen but we do see the diagram can, can you hear me okay yes you're coming in now okay did you yeah, want to make so, your point about so, the diagram and then we'll, we'll take it off screen 
Yeah, so so the law of superposition applies in a strictly vertical direction. So the bottommost layer is going to be older than the layer directly above it, adjacent to it in a vertical sequence. When you're comparing layer over here, so what you're what you're showing in your experiments is a type of cross bedding. The bottom four set over here, more sediment is deposited on top of it. Even when you're when you slow down the motion of the sediment being deposited there, that's still the case. In a strictly vertical direction, superposition still applies, and that's how it's applied in field work. So, no, your experiments do not disprove Stenel's law of superposition. Okay, take you one step further. The thing that inspired my experiments was Professor Allard Wilson, who was our professor, a uh, very famous man to deal with continental drift, etc. walked into our teaching room one time in third year geology and said, uh, students, I hate to tell you this, but the rocks in the Grand Canyon get old sideways. In other words, they've been deposited from left to right. So the fossils up here are actually older than the fossils in the same layer further down the, the, the stream front. And sure, so if these layers there, the basis for that. Well, the fact that I've been to the Grand Canyon many times since then, and he's actually right. There is a current direction. You can even see it coming with the I rocks that came in from Tennessee to uh, to end up in the, the sandstone at the top of the Grand Canyon. So the rocks have moved sideways. The minute you establish the rocks moving sideways as your principle, then all of a sudden it may be at the bottom up here, but it's way older in theoretical terms than the one in the same layer 100 kilometres further down the track. And likewise, if this got there uh, uh, before this one here, then the one at the bottom yeah, there... I, I understand your point, older. but let me stop you there, because not all the layers you see in the Grand Canyon have the type of cross bedding that you see in your flume experiments. So concluding that they all they were all deposited horizontally in a lateral direction does not follow. In fact, we have evidence they were deposited horizontally in a vertical direction, so one on top of the other. Why, why don't we see cross bedding in all these, these strata if they were deposited laterally? Professor Wilson and I would have to disagree with you there, and I've climbed in and out of the Grand Canyon many times, and if you have rock layers being Tell deposited... What, yes, I appreciate you'll find some cross bedding there, but in reality, if you have rocks coming in one on top of the other from multiple uh, events, then you need your to establish where your eroded beds are and all those sort of things. And so that's so we're not talking about there. unconformities here. We're talking about the cross beds within the layers. Why don't all the layers have cross bedding if they were deposited because horizontally? They, I would suspect that if we could afford like a, a Guy Bateau to have a huge strata machine, we'd show that cross bending is not necessarily an example of it at all. It's so just one so then you don't have evidence that these layers were deposited horizontally at the moment. Uh, in the Grand Canyon, I agree with Professor uh, uh, Wilson. They, they definitely do show being... They, they, if you're looking What's and saying cross splitting has to be an example of the way of bringing the horizontal, I, I don't necessarily agree with that. It depends on the speed of your water. Well, yes, but the flume experiments that you use show cross bedding. So if you want to use the, your flume experiments as evidence that all these layers were deposited horizontally, you need to show the cross bedding. The fact that we don't observe it um, means no, they weren't. That, that would be one case only. And if you want to donate money to, to send us, give us a, a huge strata machine, we'll happily take it, eh, Donnie? <laughs> and I think also you'll see that um, cross bedding is not the only example of uh, a geological feature that you see within the, the flume experiments. The initial flume experiments were based off of not only Guy Bartos, but I forget the other uh, guy from Venice who worked on uh, on Delta, particularly the, De the Venice Delta. And you don't have cross bedding there, but you do have sediments that are moving sideways as they are forming layers what it should effectively appear have the appearance of one on top of the other, but they are moving sideways. So just as John said, you can trace flow, which uh, cross bedding is not the only example that you can see in sure. flow. You can trace the flow from Tennessee all the way down to the Grand Canyon, um, and it's it's not necessarily just cross bedding. So right, but we can show that all the layers the in the Grand Canyon are, are not all from a deltaic environment. We we can tell that from other sedimentary features. 
oh, we're not we're not just purely saying this is a delta, therefore that's a delta, or this is cost bedding, therefore that's cost bedding. What you're showing is a principle about the way that sediment behaves when it's in water. Because the old, you know, primary school example of stick, stone, sand and mud in a glass jar and shake it up and down and then allow the water to settle and then watch the sediment sink down, effectively giving your example of Steno's uh, principle of superposition, which is in every kindergarten, you know, learn about rocks and fossils book. It would be a wonderful principle if the world was a glass of water, but it's not. No, because that, before that, that would be the, the, way the law of original spread, horizontality, not the law of superposition. Before you even get to water um, being suspended with sediment to settle one on top of the other, you still have to get the sediment in the water in the first place. So take it a scale back and you look at sandstone. For every cubic metre of sandstone, you require approximately three cubic metres of uh, some form of granitic rock to be eroded away in the first place, which again comes from flowing water equaling erosion. So we're dealing with a much, much bigger picture than just purely cross bedding uh, as an example. Sure, I agree to that point, but the fact is that you're talking about the law of original horizontality, which even before Guy Berfault's results, geologists already knew that. So it's possible for layers to be laid down in a non-vertical direction, so horizontally, and the law of superposition will still apply because, again, sediments, there has to be sediments there to be deposited there before sediments on top of it get on, like, one does not exclude the other, is what I'm saying. And before you respond, Joe, that is time. I appreciate it, Andrew. Okay. So, John, Joe, let's give you the final word, and then uh, we'll move to the next person. Go ahead. Over to you, John. Um, whilst you may have a case in point for certain points of deposition where one equaled the other, in reality, I repeat, I agree with Professor Wilson having walked the Grand Canyon this way, that way, and everything else, and having looked at where the sediments come from, such as the ones in Tennessee, you will find that they are massive beds, and the principle of superposition, whilst it's used to say the bottom layer got there first and so on up, when you look at it, the, the bottom layer, uh, the first rocks are the ones in the east, the, the last rocks are the ones in the west, even though they are stratigraphically identical. And Donnie, if I can just make a point, because of my wife, I'll probably have to leave after this next question, if that's okay. Joe, what do you want to say? Uh, well, just that I've got about 15 minutes or so left. That brings me around to the half the half past on, on my time, which is two and a half hours. So, um, yeah, I think one more one more engagement, and that sounds good. I'm not going to jump in. I'm going to jump in because, because there's been a couple that have been patiently waiting. So, Joe, if you got 15 minutes, we're going to have to break up two people within 15 minutes. And so let's... Okay. Let's move along smoothly, and I'm going to bring in Grayson. He's he's a prominent debater in the debate community, so he's been waiting patiently. I do appreciate it. We've had a great showing for uh, tonight's event. We've had well over 100 people the entire time. So We'll just have to do it again. Sometimes. Yes, we will. Sooner than later, for sure. Okay, so scriptures and stones, from my understanding, you just had a question. And so let's allow you to present your question, and then we're going to give the majority of our final minutes to, to Grayson, as there's a lot of people who have been uh, looking forward to a, a Grayson versus John and Joe showdown. <laughs> so scriptures and stones. Uh, quick intro, and what's your question, uh, my good man? Uh, yes, um, I am a former young earth creationist who's now an old earth creationist. Um, I studied uh, geology, I'm a science teacher in college. I'm working on a, a master's degree right now. I just have to write my thesis in Christian apologetics. Um, anyway, um, I've got a feature that was one of the things that kind of slowly ate away at my young earth viewpoint um, in college. It's the Serpent Mound uh, Impact uh, Crater in uh, Southern Ohio. And one of the interesting things there, um, uh, the place I live, we've got most of the Paleozoic, everything except uh, the uh, Cambrian and uh, nothing above Mississippians. So we've got Ordovician up to the Carboniferous. And uh, the interesting thing about this crater is these layers are offset there. Some of them flipped on edge, some of them completely flipped over in sequence, which means that it would had to have been hardened and you've got breaches inside the crater. So they would have had to have been hardened. And if the impact was after the flood, then I wouldn't even be alive here. There'd be no life. It, um, it's halfway eroded. So it, we would still have things migrating in here, um, at least uh, given if you include all the Native American history. So I was wondering how they could explain that in their model. 
um, to make sense of some of these areas that show that you would have to have really significant hardening before these uh, craters formed in a flood model. Okay, the one thing I've discovered is that hardening of rocks doesn't take very long at all, so that we have a lovely deposit at, at a place called Shelley Beach, where when I was taken there on, on a field trip and our professor explained it, he said yesterday this was sand, had a storm last night, hot water, hot rain water, and today it's solid rock. The limestone in the shells is crushed out to sea with the turbulence. It comes in, it dissolves in the hot water, and overnight the ground cools down, and by morning it's it's like concrete. So you don't need time to make a rock go hard. Now, I've never been to the location you, you mentioned. I don't know if Joe has, but uh, it would be nice to get there and uh, have, a, have a look at that. We don't have too many impact craters that are too visible here in Australia. We have uh, some over towards the Northern Territory border, etc. But in reality, uh, the principle I know for a start is it doesn't take long to harden rock. And secondly, one of the principles we've discovered is the more bacteria you have, the quicker the rock sets, because um, we've been dealing with formations of stalactites and the erosion of caves. And the some, some of the bacteria we've looked at in association with the professor at the University of Edinburgh can actually generate caves uh, unbelievably by the high pH of the stuff that they exude. So both the formation and the dissolution doesn't require time. But before I duck out, I'll make one, one comment for all of you who are listening. Have you noticed so far we have not had anybody present any evidence of evolution? Very important. Have you noticed so far we have not had anybody disagree with the devolution of things uh, or offer evidence that the world is going in any other way? Now, the young man who's asking the question, good question, but I'd suggest you need to study how long it takes rocks to actually set hard, put in pressure, put in natural cements, put in volcanic compression even. Uh, that's where I'd go if I were you. Joe? You're muted. Joe? Oh, I think Joe might be on mute or your audio is unplugged because it looks like you're... Hey, John, I can make an argument for evolution before you go. <laughs> go right ahead, mate. Okay, yeah. How do you explain how we're able to predict transitional fossils before they're found? Like the actual anatomy that these fossils have, whether this was therapsids, tictolic, archaeopteryx. How is it that using evolution, we can predict these transitional anatomies before we find them? Um, most probably because the creatures who occupy different levels of the what you'd call the environment need scaled up versions of what facilities they have. But none of your statements tell you that A turned into part B, turned into B, turned into part C. None of that is actually evidence of change itself. You've got evidence of different morphologies, which you arrange as transitional. Now, unless you live side by side with them and watch them transition, you are making an absolutely fabricated case. Can so, I make a point on that really quickly? Because I see this in a lot of debates between evolutionists and creationists. Um, proving or disproving teleology, you know, the design in something uh, or opposing a naturalistic uh, framework. You mentioned worldviews and how that plays into this. And we've got two competing hypotheses. Um, if somebody discovered a fossilized uh, glowfish and were able to study the DNA of it, let's just say some of the DNA is preserved, and in the future, if either of our positions, they could argue and make a case to explain why the glowfish has the glowing DNA, so to speak, unless they knew that it was actually designed. So I, I don't see much productivity in arguing the design or non-design of something when we're coming at it with two different worldviews, unless there's a way we can compare those worldviews. And that's what I'd be interested to see, because I'm curious whether or not you're approaching science from a presuppositional framework or an evidential framework, because I'm I'm OK with science having a better explanation than what I actually believe, because I know science is progressing and, and it could be wrong, could be right on something. It's not absolutely true. It's just our best empirical evidence. Um, so are you coming at it presuppositionally or? you will find that presupposition is what gave us science. So by the time you get the Reformation, you get Martin Luther, by the time you get Steno and that, their presupposition was there was a God of law and order. The presupposition of the Greeks was the gods were gods of chaos. 
you start from those different presuppositions and you'll handle evidence differently. Now, I have a presupposition that all the evidence supports presuppositionalism, if you can put up with that sort of a pun. Nobody can begin anywhere else except the presupposition. First of all, you believe the world is real. Uh, talk to Hindus, they don't. First of all, you believe that you're rational. Read the newspapers, there's abundant evidence we aren't. First of all, you have to believe that for every rational question, there's a real and rational answer. So, yes, you hit it on the head. I certainly start with the presuppositional position and the evidence goes from there. And even when I've debated Dawkins, he's exactly the same. His blind faith presupposition is atheism and he starts from there. Hope that's helpful as an answer. But, uh I'm going to hand it to Grayson. Did you have a follow up? Go ahead. Yeah, I'd like to follow up with how you responded to my point about transitional fossils being predicted, because I don't think that what you brought up is actually relevant. I asked you how we're able to predict these beforehand. I'm not asking about assuming one thing came to another, one thing was ancestral, or whatever. That's just part of your hypothesis, right? Like you're using the theory of ev evolution to generate a hypothesis for what transitional anatomy you would predict to find in these fossils. So that's just your methodology of how you're coming up with the prediction. What we're actually, I'm asking about is why is it that those predictions are matched by the reality of the fossils that we find? Are we just getting lucky over and over and over again? No, you're not. What you're doing is assuming that if you find a fossil, it's actually a transitional form. Nope. Now you can say it's morphologically transitional, but the fossil you find is dead. It's not doing anything. Mm -hmm. You have no idea what its DNA is. Yeah. You have no idea. I mean, when I studied uh, genetics, I deliberately did that at Queensland University just to check how you could do living things. And you could arrange the, the, the flies and everything else showing transitional forms. But then you discovered that a different arrangement of DNA produced similar effects or a similar arrangement of DNA produce different effects. I can, I can call grant transition if you like, but it's got nothing to do with what we call evolution. Yeah, okay, look, for the sake of this argument, I can grant that every single fossil that's ever been found had no children and had no descendants of any kind. I can grant you to that entirely. It doesn't change my argument in the least. The argument is that using, like all of these could be sister clades, right? These could just be sister groups and not the true ancestral transitional forms. It doesn't sure. matter. What matters is that using evolutionary theory, the actual anatomy was predicted beforehand. Anatomies that we don't see in, in living things anymore, like the Tiktaalik anatomy, we don't see that. We don't see like the way that synapsids, like the, the therapsid jaws form to the base of their skulls. We don't see Archaeopteryx with unfused digits on their wings. Like we don't see these anatomies, but they were predicted using evolution. And then we found fossils that have those transitional anatomic features themselves. I don't care if you say that these are not ancestral and you can't prove their genetic relationships. That doesn't matter to my question. Um, well, I can't disagree with your question because there is some reality there, but it's a meaningless reality, right? The fact is God created this, God created that. You arrange it in a great cycle of being like Archimedes did and that before creation versus evolution, but they're essentially um, gods of some sort of order or disorder and you end up with a great chain of being which you can argue is or even isn't evolution and you can put them in an arrangement of order. Uh, you could predict to try and fit them in, but in reality, every time we've found living things and put them in an order, you can then say, well, something should fit in there. And to which you say, so. Yeah, There's but, no, I mean, no benefit, no benefit to what you are saying there as a means of explanation at all. So it, uh, you're making testable predictions that are falsifiable, and then we're verifying those predictions, and those predictions were made using the theory of evolution. This is how all scientific theories are validated. So, like, the fact that you can use evolution to make these predictions of anatomy, so, like, are you trying to make the case that you could use creationism to predict novel anatomies in the fossil record before that they're found? And if so, why hasn't that ever been done? Okay, it has been done. Read Stephen Gould. And the reason he ended up with the hopeful monster theory is he said creation works better than evolution for predicting where your groups are going to be. And they fall essentially into biblical characters in which each group is separate and unrelated. Read Stephen Gould on his hopeful monster theory, and he would disagree with you. So what, what did Stephen Gould predict? Which fossil? 
basically his statement is that you will find them they fit best into creation categories. That's so there statement. isn't any specific fossil that he predicted should exist beforehand? No, because once you find a fossil, uh, your statement that it fits in between A and B assumes the bottom layer got there first, assumes the fossil order represents time, assumes evolution, right? So you're going around around in circles. And Stephen Gould, like Professor Ager, like my Professor Carter, said once the fossil appears, it seems to be inherently stable. There is no evolution, even if your classification system puts it between A and C. It is, is meaningless. So Purely if, theoretical. if evolution was true, then you would expect to find a fossil that had anatomy in between A and B. That's the and prediction. If creation is true. Why would creation pre make that same prediction? Because creation would predict that you would find a group of creatures that would fit the environment they're designed for. And if they needed intermediate features like frogs and fish versus human beings, you would. I mean, that's an intermediate in a real sense. And you could predict it if you like, or predict you find a salamander that's half toad and, and, and halfway towards a, a, you know, a marsupial or a mammal or whatever. So the predictability is purely logical sequence, but logic is not true. It's well, just reasonable. So it's interesting because with the creation model, if all these were separate ancestries, you could predict intermediate anatomies in between any two groups of animals. But in evolution, that's not the case. You can only predict intermediate anatomies between two closely related groups. So that's a difference between the creation and the evolution model. And when we look at the fossils, we see transitional anatomies between closely related groups like evolution predicts. And we don't find transitional anatomies between two distantly related groups in the evolution right. model. I'll, I'll disagree with you because I know how we got those creatures that are A, B, and C, and we found B1 and B2, and we put them there based on our belief in time, our belief in the order of the rocks, our belief in index fossils, and if you just found it by itself in Australia, you probably wouldn't have done that. But it's not a prediction uh, that confirms evolution. It may be consistent with what they teach you evolution is, but there's no problem with saying, well, God made this, and the evidence shows it was different at the start. The evidence shows it was different at the finish if it's died out, or the evidence shows it's still different and not transitioning anywhere at the present time. The real world is the best evidence against your argument. Right. So the real world. In the real world, we have a track record of confirmed predictions made using the theory of evolution from therapsids, Archaeopteryx, Tiktaalik, yeah. like, et cetera, et cetera. Like Sphecomirma, like there's a lot that I could list off. But there is a track record of exactly zero times that the creation model has been used to generate a prediction for a certain anatomy in the fossil record that has then gone on to be found. So just comparing the real world track record of these two things. Okay. The real track record is if you find beetles with wings on the mainland of Australia, uh, given the history of the world as devolution, you could predict that somewhere beetles will be found without wings because they've devolved. So these are predictions you could make if you want to, same as we did with the snakes tonight. The Christians would have said, we will find snakes with legs, right? And that's exactly what's happened. So you're absolutely incorrect in saying this is unpredictable, it's usable. But Donnie, I hate to say this, my grandson's just come out of the house. I've got to go and check with my wife now. Sorry, guys, my wife has got dementia and I, I need to go and check how she's getting on. Wait, before you go, can you just tell me who was the creationist who predicted snakes with legs should be found? Me. You. So I, you predicted I did this, this before. At Queensland University many years ago. I wrote a textbook on search for the origin of life, which you can have a look at. I gave a lecture series to the Canadian Education Group after having won a debate against four professors at once in Saskatchewan. So the track record is there as to what creationists can predict. Right. Creation is very predictable that things will produce after their kind, even if you think they're transitional. That's the world you live in. That's why Stephen Gould said traditionally the creationists have been the best of the geologists, not the evolutionists. Derek Ager says the same. Read it up. And Donnie, I'm going to have to bid you farewell, mate, after two and a half hours. And really good to meet you, mate. OK, gentlemen. Very good. Uh, God bless, John. Appreciate it. Grayson. Scriptures and Stones, thank you for uh, joining. I am going to uh, remove everybody for now and just leave it to me. John, thank you so much. Okay, well, everybody, uh, two and a half hours has flown by. I know these uh, open mics can be fast-paced and they never seem long enough. 
unless it's the open mics that we do for five hours. So there's only so much we can get in <laughs> in two and a half hours, but we had a uh, nonstop interaction and debate essentially from the beginning. If I remember correctly, we had uh, Mr. Anderson uh, engage John and Joe for about uh, 32 minutes. There's a full uh, cross exam right there. Uh, we had Jackson Rowe, some very interesting back and forth on the fossil record. Uh, we also had uh, Doc, uh, who brought forth the presentation uh, for Joe and John to engage, and uh, Andrew, Scriptures and Stones, and also uh, Grayson. So if I calculated that correctly, we had about seven people, seven uh, skeptics for a two and a half hour open mic debate. And we even got a mini presentation from Joe and a mini presentation from John. I really uh, enjoyed that sparring match uh, that we just uh, witnessed from uh, John in Grayson, some great fast paced back and forth. And so, okay, I really enjoyed tonight. Uh, these open mics are always a blast. Engaging and interacting in the debate dojo is important as it gets us out of our uh, theological and scientific based uh, echo chambers. And it allows uh, both creationists and evolutionists to uh, engage in fast, fast paced dialogue. And I think that's uh, important to uh, do. So hopefully we'll get uh, John and uh, Joe in the future again for another open mic. And I should be uh, implementing uh, several more in the next month or so. You know, we've been doing five or six events a week. I think we've had somewhere between 14 events out of the last 15 days. And so, okay, I think we're basically going to wrap it up there. Uh, typically, you know, when we've got Kent on, we'll open up the mic uh, for another few hours. But for John and Joe, we want to leave this as uh, just a strict two and a half hour open mic debate challenge with uh, John Mackay and Joe Hubbard. I really do appreciate everybody that has in, uh, joined. And I also like the fact that we've had a good uh, diversity and in, in variation of topics discussed with a little bit of uh, back and forth on the topic of evidence for evolution there at the end. And so, okay, tomorrow what we have, I just wanted to double check here. Um, okay, so Dr. Dan Biddle from Genesis Apologetics, they have a new uh, movie, The Ark in the Darkness, if I'm not mistaken. And that uh, film is going into uh, theaters. And so that's pretty cool. Uh, Sam and I, we're going to be joined by Dan Biddle tomorrow for an interview. And so we're just going to be talking about his new film. We're going to be uh, helping to promote it as I think uh, that's pretty cool. That's going to be in, in theaters for, for people to to check out. And so, okay, I think we're going to wrap it up there. Again, this was, uh, this was a lot of fun. Two and a half hours has flown by and I am thrilled that we were still able to get seven guests and therefore seven mini debates as each guest was given anywhere between 20 and uh, 32 minutes with the, uh, the higher end with, with Mr. Anderson. So, okay, everybody. Thank you for tuning in. I should say, I really apologize to those who are backstage still. Again, I do my best to organize uh, an open mic with limited time, two and a half hours. I get some open mics, we go for five hours. We did a Trinity open mic with Matt Slick recently. We went for five hours. And so it's a lot easier to give uh, people more time when you have more time allotted for, for the open mic. But uh, I had to do my best with the two hour, two and a half hours that was given to me. So apologies to anyone backstage who uh, did not get the opportunity to join and engage, but that's why we will hopefully uh, book another one of these open mics with uh, John and Joe at some point in the future. So with that, God bless all. Thank you for tuning in and standing for truth is out. <laughs>